Good evening and welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Tuesday, January 14th. Uh, I'm going to start off with a couple of announcements. Uh, we will be together keeping the promise on Martin Luther King Day next Monday, January 20th at 4 p.m. in the Coolidge Corner Theater with keynote speaker Reverend Liz Walker and Brookline High School students who followed the Freedom Trail through the South last year. Also, next week, we will be celebrating Climate Week, January 20th through 26th. Many events schedule throughout the week, and we have a brochure that's uh, available to everybody, um, and also uh, information at brooklineclimateweek.org. But just uh, to give people a taste, there will be an event all day on Saturday, January 25th, in the morning from 8 until 11, you can drop off wearable children's clothing, particularly infant to preschool sizes at the Public Safety Building. From 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Town Hall, there will be a Reduce, Reuse, Recycle uh, program with a food court, uh, advice on home energy savings, drop-offs for everything you could possibly want to get rid of, and in particular, styrofoam packaging products, which cannot be recycled except through a special process. In the afternoon from 2 to 4 p.m., there will be a workshop on emergency preparedness in the public safety building. From 3 to 4 p.m., a presentation and discussion on global warming at the Coolidge Corner Library. And in the evening from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. at the new teen center, a pizza reception, I don't know if pizza is environmentally correct, but a pizza reception and a showing of the public uh, broadcasting documentary, The Journey of the Universe. So all of those things are scheduled for uh, Saturday next week and lots of other things going on during uh, the week at different times. And also, uh, next week on Thursday at 7 p.m. in the Devotion School Auditorium, there will be a community meeting on the devotion uh, renovation planning and feasibility study with the architects. Uh, Superintendent Lupini will be there, members of the school committee will be there, and the Devotion Building Committee and also Devotion staff to answer questions. Any other announcements? Yes. Yeah. Um, Benka. I actually have a personal announcement. Um, I will not be running for re-election this year. Um, I'm having surgery at the end of this month, and uh, I'll have a couple of weeks of house arrest after that. Um, after that, I'll uh, be focusing on recuperating, and um, I'll be involved, obviously, with the continuing work of the board and the uh, work of the zoning bylaw committee, and uh, also finishing up the work of the override study committee. Um, and that's a, ro a, a role that I hope to continue if it happens to go past May with some items to tie up. But um, uh, with those uh, items and also I, uh, my desire to continue my commitment to uh, teaching and tutoring, um, I uh, don't feel that I'll be in a position to um, run a campaign for re-election uh, this year during the uh, recuperation period. So uh, I will not be running, uh, not closing the door on the future, uh, but uh, I am uh, actually very thankful that we can now do things remotely. And I <laughs> intend to take advantage of that for a few weeks, uh, at least um, uh, after uh, the 1st of February. So I thought I would make the announcement now uh, to let people know and make it official, I, I have to say we, we all believe that you could probably recuperate and run and be elected. But yeah. we, we will reluctantly accept your decision that you have a priority of recuperation, which I totally understand. And wish you a very speedy right. recovery. Right, yes. right. absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I want to thank you for your, your extremely hard work on this board. And, um, yeah, I hope you do consider running again in the future and um, want to, uh, yeah, wish you the best on recovery and... Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, on to And business. remote participation. And, yeah, I'm, I'm we'll, very we'll, pleased. We'll master the, yeah, tech, I'm very the technique pleased about of that. remote participation. We will, we will get very good at that, I'm sure. 
Okay, other announcements from board members? Then I will How do you move. follow on. that up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, move to our miscellaneous calendar, and um, the first item is minutes from January 7th. Do we have corrections I, in the I minutes? I have given um, Kate a little correction. Okay. And I, I do have some small edits. Then I move that we approve the minutes from January 7th as amended. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. And we'll move to items on the miscellaneous calendar. The first one is a water audit contract. Commissioner Papa Sturgeon. And is this Mr. Russell coming? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, it's a privilege here to be in front of you. It's my first time. Um, I do apologize ahead of time if I refer to you as Alderman. Please uh -oh, I, don't I, I, no, even no. think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, um, um, essentially we're here for the phase two of the water audit. Phase one was completed back in 2000, November of 2012. And really what I call the, the first phase was the, the view from 50,000 feet as far as all right, what is all encompassing of our water system? Where do we go? Try to pinpoint and prioritize where we can make improvements and then proceed to phase two, which we're at now. Phase two is now taking all the information from phase one, which evaluated the entire system, prioritizing where we can make some efficiencies and infrastructure improvements, and then ultimately with the uh, result reducing our unaccounted for water. For the town so that's sort of an, uh, a quick overview um, if there's any questions I know mr. Benka had uh, an email that I um, sent him a, requ uh, a response Would you to like so. to put that yeah. into the public record yeah no I um, I actually don't have the email um, with me but let me ask the question sure. um, I looked at um, this contract and it seemed to me that um, there, there was um, basically accumulation and manipulation of, of data, and my question was, why is this something that uh, we couldn't do in-house? Um, what, uh, what's involved here that requires us bringing in somebody from the outside, given uh, the expertise that we have in-house? And um, I know that um, there, that you responded to um, essentially flow metering. Um, checking the flows at uh, the master meters and at some of the large meters in town. And I didn't see that in this contract called mm -hmm. out explicitly. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering um, no, why. It was a great question. Um, first of all, the, the collection of data, number one, is extremely time um, intensive, if you will. Um, not only looking back this past year, but you really have to go back at least three years. And that's looking at all of the metered data that we have, residential, commercial, and looking for anomalies. And actually, uh, the, 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 there's a big part in collecting the data, but also, more importantly, the interpretation of that data and knowing what you're looking at to see if you can outline and, and define certain anomalies. Um, along with that is the, what we call right sizing or looking at right sizing of commercial meters. Meters that are oversized. For instance, most people think a four-inch line, you put a four-inch meter. That's absolutely not the case. Um, when you have a larger, uh, an oversized meter, what tends to happen is the low flows or the medium flows actually get by the meter without being picked up, which results in a significant reduction in, in, in or a loss of revenue, if you will. So what this also includes is to data log and actually right-size some of our commercial meters to make sure there's no loss of revenue. Um, Beyond that, um, um, we have four MWRA meters that service the town of Brookline. Um, meter number 98, if you will, um, essentially half of the flow that serves the town comes through meter 98. Well, when they did their inspection, uh, they being the consultants who, who were recommending for the award, looked at meter 98, that, that was in deplorable condition. It was, it was rusty, it was, there was no way to calibrate it, there was no way to put a flow meter on it. So we have to open discussions with MWRA for them to actually take that and replace that meter. Because it's, it's, again, it's, ser it's servicing essentially 49 or 50 percent of the water that the town gets. So in order to go before the, the, um, the MWRA for that request, we need to have the backup data from this consultant 
as, um, as you know, reinforcement to them so to make them, to, to substantiate them to replace that meter. So these are the things that we can't do in-house. Um, and again, as far as the time and the interpretation of the data um, that you're, that you're um, referring to, Mr. Banka, um, again, that's more left to a consultant that is spe specific in that area. Okay. Um, let, just to, to focus specifically on the question, as, as I understand it, the, um, the way to determine whether one of our uh, customers' commercial meters in town is right-sized or is not right-sized is to actually measure the flow through that meter. meter. To put another flow meter in that line, um, a data logger, we call them, yes. Or data, a data logger. Correct. Um, and similarly, um, the way to determine whether meter 98 or any of the other four MWRA master meters is recording correctly is to put a flow meter or a data logger on Correct. those lines. Correct. Is doing that, putting that flow meter on or having that data logger, is that included in this $25,000 contract? Yes, it is. Yes, okay. it is. Yes, it is. Um, I, you know, Do you feel better now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I would love to see it explicit. I, what I was curious as to whether the AWWAM36 guidelines had those built into it or whether there's some, some I mean. Well, there are, there are guidelines, absolutely. And, AP, and, I, and, I, and I state that, you know, you have to follow AWWA protocol in order to, 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 um, to do this. Okay. Um, I guess the best way, his what really sold me on it is that town roughly spends about six million dollars a year in the MWA for their water assessment. Um, if we, this survey, if you will, or this audit allows us to save one percent of right. that unaccounted for water, that's sixty thousand dollars. No, I, it, it absolutely, you know, it absolutely makes sense, I, I think, if it goes to actually checking mm -hmm. the flows. Um, I just didn't see that mm -hmm. in this contract. Okay, okay, fair enough. Okay, any other questions for Mr. Russell? Nope. All right, sounds like we, we think this is a, a good plan. Um, then I will move that we approve and execute contract number PW14-26, phase two water audit in the amount of $25,000. Could I just add, with the understanding that it includes necessary, that the contract price includes the necessary flow metering? Yes. Is that fair? Sure. Okay. And Kate, do you have that? Okay. Everybody understands the vote? Yes. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Benka? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Selectman Wyszynski? Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you, Mr. Thank Russell. Thank you. And Mr. Russell, thank you for your prompt response <laughs> and uh, welcome. Right. Thank, thank you. Um, I do hope the MWRA is going to be very friendly with us given all of the work that we've been doing with them. Um, okay, next item is a pet shelter trailer. You folks have got to explain to me about this. Good evening. Chief, welcome. <laughs> Happily explain about this. You know, um, we have a very active CERT team in town that um, activates our shelters when, when necessary. And there have been a number of occasions where we have activated emergency shelters and we've taken people out of their homes and they've come to the shelters for um, re refuge and they've had pets with them. Their pets um, we have to make special accommodations for because not everybody in the shelter likes a pet, but the pet means a lot to the pet owner. Uh, so with that, a lot of people in the UASI group uh, have been running into the same problems as we have at the shelters. And so one of the things that they decided to try to um, accommodate everybody was to get a trailer and equip it with um, enough cages, you will, to put the, the animals in, uh, supplies to let the animals uh, survive through what it could be a couple of days in the shelter, and just to make it the, both the pet and the uh, pet owner comfortable as well as the other people that are using the shelter. So we had the opportunity to apply for one of these trailers and it comes fully stocked um, at a cost of $7,797 and th that cost will be picked up by the UIC region if the board is so inclined to vote it on our behalf. Okay. I wouldn't kibble with this. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, any questions for the chief? 
Where would the uh, trailer be stored when it's not housing? We're looking for a home. Uh huh. And I, and I was going to have a discussion with Andy. Let, oh, he didn't leave yet. Uh, yeah. Andy, <laughs> he knew what was coming <laughs> before the week's out. He, he's he's hiding, ducking down he's there. He's hiding back there. Yeah. yeah. Well. Um, I, I, I certainly think the, the notion in an emergency of being able to accommodate uh, people who are displaced pets is a, a great idea, but I'm hoping that we don't have too many demands for it. That would be my hope. Right. So you do need to find a nice, safe parking place where it can stay. <laughs> we currently house the trailers up in um, the back of Station 6 uh -huh. on Hammer Street. We do uh -huh. have three other trailers that are, one is loaded with... Um, Two of them are loaded with um, supplies to run shelters, and the third one has the beds in it. Well, we'll have a conversation with the DPW commissioner about this. Okay, I move that we accept a grant in the amount of $7,797.02 from the Urban Area Security Initiative for a pet shelter trailer. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Binka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. And now you have an additional gift? Yes. Uh, the Reverend Lee from the Korean Church, right across the, the parking lot here, has been very generous to the police department over the years. And this year was no different. He came in just before the Christmas holidays and he um, donated a check of $500 to the Brookline Police Department. And in keeping what we have done all along, uh, and, and we use it for uh, community policing activities, we put it right back into the community when events are scheduled around town and purchases that we don't budget for need to be made in order to make these events a success and I want to see if the board would accept that and we'll do it again this year. Well I, I just would remind everyone that we actually um, the Reverend Lee had uh, also made a donation to the fire department and the fire chief was here last week when we were grateful to accept the Korean church's donation so I'm Pretty sure we'll do it again, Slightly daily. Yeah, no, I, I just think uh, it's wonderful uh, the way these guys step up and contribute to the community and very happily will accept it. Thank you. So, and, and I, I will um, follow up on my comments uh, from last week. Um, the, um, uh, I had the pleasure of representing the board at uh, the Korean Cultural Festival that uh, the church uh, sponsored uh, this this past year um, and um, uh, that uh, marked the 60th anniversary of the church and also um, an important anniversary in Reverend Lee's life so uh, it was um, uh, just a, a wonderful event and um, I think they've done that now for six years mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Um, longer than that and they are a um, Okay. Uh, an important part of this community. Yes. Right. So, uh, therefore, I move that we accept a grant, or sorry, a donation in the amount of $500 from the Korean Church of Boston to be used for community policing activities. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Binka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Um, next item is a, another grant having to do with the bike share program. Mr. Viola. Good evening, Joe Viola, Assistant Director of Community Planning. Um, it's exactly right. We're asking the board to accept an additional $95,932 in clean air and mobility funds. And part two is that we're asking the board to authorize the chair to execute an amendment and extension of our existing contract uh, with MassDOT so we can begin expending those funds uh, towards our operational costs. Uh, the board may remember as we got ready to launch Hubway in the spring of 2012, we got the initial grant of $96,000. Uh, that basically bought us 34 bikes and got us through two years of operation of Hubway. Uh, we spent down basically every penny uh, and after resubmitting to MassDOT with a revised scope of work and budget, uh, the contract that's before you tonight was forthcoming. Uh, essentially, DOT has asked, they're, they've recommended that we uh, amend and extend the existing contract and make it a total contract of $192,000, $192,240. Uh, the remaining or the additional $95,000 will get us at least through the next operational year for Hubway. It's, it's a good possibility it could be extended even beyond that, but it should, this 
some will easily cover our operations for next year. So um, with that, I don't know if there are any other questions. Well, I, I'm going to ask a sort of uh, overview question, and maybe uh, Selectman Wyshynski can chime in. Remind me, we are in a, a relationship for our hubway portion, but we also are part of a larger multi-community, Boston right. and others. Is that right? Sure, uh, yes. We're, we partner, we're partners with Boston, Somerville, Cambridge. Uh, it's a four-community system. Uh, it essentially serves as... It's seamless. I mean, you can ride from one station in Brookline to any other station. Uh, and you're exactly right. We're, we're certainly in a partnership with those other communities. Um, we, we, we all have different funding sources. It happens to be that we're getting federal funds to, uh, to operate our system, but it, it doesn't work the same uh, in every other system. Uh, but we're, we're governed by a, reason, a regional memo of understanding or memo MOA. Mm -hmm. And, and I understand from Selectman Wyshynski that there might have been a, uh, an opportunity to reconsider the right. contractual. Um, the uh, Hubway is now in its uh, third year. For us, it's our second year. Um, and uh, the, the, the contract cycle uh, for Hubway, it's, it's a three-year contract cycle. So, um, and Boston is the uh, taking the lead on uh, their, their contract is up first, so they're taking the lead on um, uh, looking at the future of Hubway and how it's going to be operated. And uh, we're participating in that process along with the uh, MAPC, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, um, the, and the city of Somerville, and uh, the city of Cambridge will also be affected uh, by what's going on, and the the contract is is being rebid, and 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 uh, the the RFP process is uh, is continuing. Should it should be uh, completed shortly, but it's going to have an effect on, an I think a favorable effect on um, the sustainability of Hubway uh, for us. Um, it's going to f uh, change the uh, the funding model. And uh, we as a community are going to have to think about, you know, how, how does our participation in Hubway uh, going to continue and will it grow? You know, what kind of a commitment uh, uh, will we make as a community to, to my, my growing My impression, I, 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 anybody can chime in here, is that it's being very successful, not just in Brookline, but in the regional uh, activities. And one of the great advantages is that you can leave Brookline, drop it off in Cambridge, then go to Boston and pick up another one and come back mm -hmm. to Brookline if that's what your day's activities require. So, right. Other comments? Yes. How, yeah. How, um, for, uh, for Joe or Neil, how does this interact with the idea of sponsorships? Um, can we still it, have sponsorships? Oh, yes, yes, yes. That, that's, uh, that's independent of this. And that's just another element in our strategy to make this uh, self-sustaining. Um, and you know, we're going to have to take a, a good in-depth look at um, the future of Hubway and Brookline. Uh, uh, with sponsorships, user fees, maybe there are other things we can do to help make it uh, uh, sustainable. Uh, uh, an important piece of that uh, puzzle is uh, um, uh, right sizing the operations contract. So, uh, and I'm, I'm very hopeful that uh, there'll be a good outcome, at least in that uh, uh, component. Sletman Goldstein. Is there some kind of a measure you can give us as to how far from being self sustainable the program is right now? I think um, on an operations basis, it's maybe 20 to 30,000. Um, short uh, of, of, of being completely self-sustainable, at least our portion um, uh, without any growth. Um, and it could be that um, uh, with, with the new cost structure plus the sponsorships, that might get us there with some growth in, in membership. 
Um, I, don't, I don't think, at least at this size, I don't think we're that far away from being self-sustaining. Now, if we want to grow the system, that's, that's where we're going to have to really think uh, because there's capital costs in growing the system and then there's the operation cost of additional uh, bikes. We, uh, the, the, we, uh, our share of the system is about 3%. You know, it's a, we're, we're, probably, we're the smallest piece. You know, uh, Brookline is the smallest, uh, uh, has the fewest stations. Um, and you know, we, we don't have the, you know, the land area, um, say, that Boston has to cover, or, or even Cambridge for that matter. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know how, what opportunity, how many more opportunities there are for stations. There, there are some, yeah. but um, you, know, I, you know, we're not going to have a, Boston has 100, 100-ish stations. They're looking to grow it to 150, somewhere in that range in the next year or two. Would it be fair to say that the $96,000 grant is to make up the deficit for the next three years, or are there other capital um, needs that this will go towards? This, first off, it's envisioned that the brunt of this money will pay our operations costs. I was able to write the scope of work and present a budget that actually, we could actually, depending on the success of, uh, you know, going out to bid for uh, a regional sponsor, we could potentially use some of this money to grow the system by a station or two. So we're not bound to use this money solely for operations, but if that's all we use it for, and if we could get an extension to use the money, I think it would easily carry us through at least the next two to three years, mm -hmm. assuming that the state would allow us to, to carry over the, the amount we don't use beyond this year. Yeah, an additional station is what, $40,000? About $40,000. Yeah. It's a hefty... Yeah. Uh, but, but on the other hand, you would have more users, right, which would generate more revenue? That would be the hope. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, the one of um, I, I know that there was some discussion, and I, I don't want to belabor this point, but it actually is kind of interesting. Um, there, there was some discussion of a of a station in uh, Cleveland Circle, um, and the response was, well, you know, exactly where would people go because Newton isn't participating. So, to the extent that yeah. people wanted to grab a bike and head west there really wouldn't be a station that they could drop it in. Well, so, well, you know, there, there, are, could, there could they, be stations in Brighton. Brighton, yeah. yeah. They could and have their, they can, you know, uh, a Cleveland Circle station can also be used to come into, further into Brookline. Right, right. But then a Cleveland Circle station doesn't have to be in Brookline, and that's one of the things right. I talked to the boss about. Yeah, no, but it, it's what, what um, emerged from this discussion was the fact that it really is a system. Yes. And uh, it has to work together as a system and it has to make sense as a system uh, with people essentially within 30 minutes biking distance of the next station. Right. Yep. So. So uh, just one little follow up here. Is there any possibility that there would be additional grant funds such as this in the future? Not from this source. Okay. I mean, that's not to say that there may there may be, but uh, my understanding is that the, this is the last of the clean okay. air and mobility money that we'll okay. get. So. All right. So then we, we really are waiting to hear what this rebid situation delivers, and then we'll have to look at the uh, available resources. Okay. Any more questions? Then I move that we accept an additional $95,932 in clean air and mobility grant funds to be used to support the Brookline Bike Share Program with other eligible ex op operations and other eligible expenses and to authorize the chair to execute an amendment and extension of the existing contract between the town and the Massachusetts Department of Transportation in connection with this grant. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Great. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Viola. Thank you. And then we have, uh, I hope, <coughs> a quick set of temporary uh, licenses. Um, anybody have any questions on items F, G, and H? If there are none, <clears throat> I will move uh, them together. 
I move that we grant a temporary wine and malt beverage license to the Puppet Showplace Theater in connection to an event on January 18th. I move that we grant a temporary wine and malt beverages license to Boston University College of Fine Arts in connection with a reception to be held on January 23rd. And finally, I move that we grant a permit to sell alcoholic beverages on town property to the Lars Anderson Auto Museum in connection with events to be held on January 24th and February 1st. All in favor of those three items, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Yeah, right. Okay, um, moving down the calendar. Uh, our next item is Commissioner Peppa Sturgeon again. You've been moving around snow and ice in large quantities. Yes, we have. So we heard. Yes, we have. Maybe I've got it wrong. <laughs> in fact, uh, it's all gone. I don't understand. What'd you do with it? Well, Kevin's boys took care of that. <laughs> uh, I do have to tell you that that storm we had a week and a half ago was probably one of the most uh, severe events that I can recall in a long time in terms of the temperatures and the wind. Mm. Yeah. Uh, at 3 o'clock in the morning on that Friday morning, it was probably three or four degrees below zero with a howling wind and you, you couldn't even be out on the road for more than 25 or 30 minutes in the car because the uh, windshield would ice up. You'd have to get back to a garage to get de-iced. So the, the conditions were very severe. Well, I, and, I uh, think we all appreciate how much your uh, crews did and I understand they were working like 30 hours without much of a break, right? Pretty much, yes. Yeah, yeah. Everybody who reported for work at seven o'clock on Thursday morning uh, was with us uh, through Friday at Friday night at uh, 11 or 12 p.m. So, and then we started to get concerned about the safety of our own crews and started rotating crews and giving them downtime, and then bringing them back in to uh, initiate cleanup operations. So, it was a long three or four days, but uh, uh, as usual, they got it done. Great. So, tell us what all of this cost. <laughs> well. <laughs> Do we want to Because know? of all that, here we are again, and it's <laughs> January, and I'm back before you to talk about snow and ice deficits in uh, Chapter 44, Section 31D, and all that good stuff. But uh, just to recap where we're at so far, uh, we classify each, each of these uh, storms, regardless of the intensity, as an event, uh, whether it be uh, just sending sanders out for treating... Uh, uh, icy roads or uh, in launching a full plowing operation, we label them events. We've had uh, eight events already this year, uh, beginning uh, on December 7th. Uh, of the eight events, uh, five of them were purely sanding events where we had ice conditions. Uh, and sanding events do require uh, uh, generally a, a good expenditure of funds for overtime. While it's all done with in-house crews, there generally it's it's in the overnight hours, and uh, and we're paying people overtime. And, and uh, can I just ask a question? Because I understood that because of the extreme cold, there was some difficulty possibly with the effectiveness of your sanding materials. Is that right? Salt won't work properly if the temperatures ah. are too cold. Uh, so that storm where we had the frigid temperatures, we waited till the last possible minute to apply the salt, the de-icing, <coughs> because we were afraid that, uh, well, we don't generally apply it until, we apply it at the very beginning of the storm for pre-treat, and then we don't generally apply it to the very end of the storm because we don't want to plow it to the side of the road. Uh, and that storm there, we waited to the very last minute because the temperatures were so frigid that the salt wasn't working. Uh, and we were concerned about that, so we started mixing sand, a little bit more sand with the salt uh, to try to at least gain some traction. but. But luckily, Friday afternoon, the temperatures moderated a bit, and the sun did come out for a short period of time, and that was enough to activate the salt <coughs> and get us down to bare pavement. So you're right. It doesn't work when it's uh, yeah, right. uh, very, very cold. We did have three plowing operations uh, for a total of about 26 and a half inches total so far this year already, um, which is not insignificant. I hope that that's the end of it, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, don't count on it. No, I'm not. Uh, as I've told you before, we always we always prepare for the worst and then hope for the best, so we continue to do that. 
but after a review of where we are so far in this fiscal year, uh, we are in deficit. Uh, we're de in deficit approximately $21,000 in overtime uh, for our own forces, $130,000 for snow and ice supplies, uh, which is generally the cost of the sand and salt and motor vehicle uh, supplies, and uh, about $99,000 for contractual services, which is uh, uh, what we use for equipment rental. We only had the contractor in three times this year, and that was for the three plowable events. Uh, we do try to keep that at a minimum. We don't generally call the contractor in until we get uh, four to five inches of snow or predictions for higher amounts so that we can reserve them. So at, adding those numbers up, we're in deficit right now of about $245,000 uh, out of the snow budget. Uh, as I tell you, each and every year you have several options. Uh, the board could elect, a, as it has in the past, to invoke Massachusetts General Law Chapter 44, Section 31D, uh, which then allows us to, to uh, overspend the snow and ice budget for the current fiscal year uh, without regard to the budget. Uh, and that, at that point, uh, it allows us to gain some time so that once the winter season is over, we can then reevaluate our budget. Uh, towards the end of the fiscal year, determine if we have surpluses in some of our other accounts that can be used to offset a, a portion of the snow and ice deficit uh, with the balance coming from the reserve fund generally uh, in the month of uh, April or May. Uh, so that's what we're recommending at this point in time. Uh, and we, uh, your consideration is uh, respectfully requested on this matter. Questions from members of the board? Yes, like my day. Comment. Well, I want to say first uh, to, to Kevin and, and Andy that I was out of town and I came back Friday evening and I wanted to say, you know, when we hit Brookline, it was great to see the roads were cleared and were definitely quite a bit better than other places we'd driven through on the way. So uh, please convey to all your people that we do appreciate the hard work and the day and night and day and night again, I guess, <laughs> effort on that. And we, and we will do that. Okay. You know, until you spend 25 or 30 hours <coughs> behind the wheel of one of them big trucks, you really don't have an appreciation uh, for what's involved. But I tell you, it's, uh, it's bone jarring at times. Wow. Anyway, the second thing, though, I, I want to say is I'm a big proponent of us invoking Chapter 44, Section 31D. Um, I think this has worked well in the past, and um, the, the, we've found, uh, you know, sometimes there's other accounts within the department that some of the money can go over to that. And um, that otherwise, um, uh, paying all these up front out of the reserve fund has a kind of disproportionate effect on the reserve fund. and. Um, then sometimes there's a little bit of a scramble at the end for other reserve fund transfers. Uh, the only occasion where I could see this not working is if you told us that this snowfall and this expenditure so far this year is far beyond anything that we've seen in the past, and I'm not hearing that from you, Commissioner. Is that not, correct? Not at the present time. Yeah, I mean, this, no. is, this is in line with, with what we've seen in the last five Actually, years. it's a little bit lower than what we anticipated. Okay. Yeah, it's weird. Last year we had like 60 some odd inches, is that right? Yes. Before we were over? Yep. Yeah. Great. So, uh, any other questions, comments? Seeing none, I move. And uh, is, is this the correct language that the Board of Selectmen invokes Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 44, Section 31D? in order to allow the Department of Public Works to expend funds in excess of the FY 2014 budget appropriation for snow and ice control. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you very much. All right, go plow, salt, sand, whatever you need. Or maybe we'll just continue to have good weather and then we we'll have to do any of <laughs> that. That would be nice too. No promises, though. All right. Uh, is Mr. Insangu here? Uh, we have uh, some interviews scheduled, and um, the next on our list is the Advisory Council on Public Health. I see Mr. Cohen. Would you like to come forward and tell us anything at all about yourself and what you've been doing and why you want to keep doing it? Sure. 
Good mm -hmm. evening. I'm uh, Bruce Cohen. I'm uh, director, or my day job is director of research and epidemiology in the Bureau of Health Statistics in the State Health Department. And um, I'm pleased to, to serve on the Public Health Advisory Council. And I've been co chairing since, um, I've been chairing actually since uh, Jacques Carter left. Um, I, I, I guess my role is somewhat unique since I work for the state and I've worked for the feds and actually do some consulting for the feds as well. In addition to uh, working here in Brookline Public Health, I think I bring a really unique perspective on to the issues um, that are raised here in, in Brookline. And I have to say in my travels throughout the state, we by far and away have the best local public health department in, in the Commonwealth. And um, if I had to raise one particular issue and concern <laughs> looking forward, Alan did not prompt me with this. Yeah. <laughs> but, but. <laughs> there is a lot of love. We go way back. Actually, Alan worked at DPH before he came here, as, as some of you know. Uh, I am concerned, I, uh, the way I'm concerned in my day job at the state about maintaining the infrastructure. I, um, public agencies at the state and at the community level are aging. There are lots of people who look like me. Um, and maintaining some continuity is really key. Uh, and maintaining, having the resources for continuity are, are really um, crucial to maintain that infrastructure. I know being a town meeting member that we're faced with enormous number of challenges um, and the budget is always uh, stressed, but the health department has increasingly expanded its role for inspections. New restaurants are cropping up all the time. Uh, new opportunities for inspection um, are, you know, are occurring, so the, uh, the environmental health group is um, increasingly stressed and there are new challenges for folks like me who want to age in place in Brookline and I don't have to tell you the number of uh, young kids entering um, our schools and the potential for public health issues related to them as well. So I see in the future um, more stress and strain on public health so I think it's really imperative that the town, you as our board of uh, selectmen and uh, you know and me as a town meeting member really maintain this infrastructure and provide the resources necessary so if I had to say you know leave with one message that would be um, we need to continue keeping up the great work so that we stay ahead of the curve that sounds like a good idea <laughs> um, I, I just want to make a, a, a comment um, really to you as chair Bruce um, because I believe we have more candidates than there are vacancies on the council. It is quite within the capability of the council to request the possibility of associate members should you wish additional, uh, in other words, slots to become available. Um, and we can um, refer you to the information oh, thank on you. how to do that, should thank that you. be of interest to you. Thank you for that suggestion. I, I wasn't aware of that. Okay. There are lots of opportunities to serve Brookline in public health. The Friends of Public Health is another organization where we've gotten um, a great deal of support for advocates and folks interested in supporting local community health efforts. So sometimes in, in the past, folks who haven't been able to participate on the advisory council uh, have become active in uh, Friends, which has really been a nice way to u use their strengths and energy. Okay. That, I just wanted you Thanks. to be aware of that, Thank though. You. It, it's an option that you could consider. Uh, any questions for Dr. Cohen? Yes. Let me Quick question. Well, first, uh, thank you, Dr. Cohen, for your uh, leadership and your hard work uh, for making this the great health department that you've uh, expressed a few moments ago. Uh, I want to ask you about this year's flu outbreak. I've been told that this is a dangerous flu, uh, more dangerous than we've seen in the past. And... Uh, in my experience, I'm not seeing the great push for vaccination that I've seen in the past. And maybe you'd care to comment. So, I'm, you know, 
I, um, so far from, we actually just came from a public, uh, one of our monthly meetings, and um, Dr. Balsam reported that the flu numbers are consistent with the past year, so we aren't seeing any um, emergent epidemic so far here what, in Brookline. What I heard was that the, the strain itself so has the potential we're seeing, to really hurt. Uh, um, we're seeing more H1N1, but that's part of the um, vaccine coverage this year. I, I haven't heard reports in the state health department or here locally that it's particularly virulent strain. Alan, have you? That's what but I've heard. And I haven't seen any reports of higher case fatality rates, which would reflect that kind of severity. But I, I'm happy to check in in the state health department. And are we doing town-run clinics this year? Uh, successful. Yeah. We've had yeah. four successful clinics. How many? What was the total number <coughs> vaccinated? Um, I think 1,600 people. Yeah. So. Um, I, I, we did a really great, as usual, Alan and Don Sibber, who does phenomenal work in Lynn, organizing these clinics and staffed by volunteers. I, that's what's great about being in Brookline. The MRC, um, the Medical Reserve Corps, and the CERT, you know, there's just such a wonderful wealth and commitment for helping support public health. And they've um, you know, really made these quite possible. And we move people through there incredibly rapidly and efficiently. So we've done a great job um, vaccinating people this year. Great. Will there be another opportunity? Or? Uh, I don't No other cl uh, clinics are planned. But if folks have missed their flu shot, they need to just call the health department. I don't know whether Barbara still has. Barbara Wesley, our, our, our another phenomenal employee, um, our nurse, um, has will make appointments on a case by case basis. Thank you, Doctor. Sure. Selectman Daly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Bruce, for being sure. willing to re up here. Um, I my question is: Are we seeing? I'm hearing about parents um, not wanting to get their kids vaccinated for the sort of common things. Are we having a problem with that here in Brookline? I, again, I, no more than usual. Uh, you know, I, I think it, it, it's sort of, in my experience historically, it depends on the media wave and the the attention. And um, if there are articles that appear, for instance, if there's some prominent movie personality who has concerns with vaccination, you might see a, a little blip in um, you know people. Uh, parents' concerns about vaccine, um, you know, that, that certainly has happened in the past. I don't think there's any, any concern um, this year about vaccination refusal. I haven't heard any from Alan or, or, from, the, or from the schools having that as an issue. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank um, you. We're not going to be making appointments to the council tonight, but certainly fairly shortly we will do that thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve and you are very thank welcome you. thank you right back at you <laughs> ms leffman so uh and it's always hard to be the second person. <laughs> Bruce is but always a hard act. I know, I know. But I, so I love being his. You know, tell us, his tell shadow. us about your interest in the council and what you're interested. Maybe more about what you think's coming up in the future. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you for allowing me to reintroduce myself. Um, I've been on the advisory council since 2003. So I've had the opportunity to work with the amazing staff at the Brookline Health Department and to see firsthand all the amazing work that's being done in Brookline. Um, and it's complementary to my day job, which is the community health coordinator at the Wellesley Health Department. So I work on many of the same initiatives that Brookline is involved in. So it's really a wonderful relationship um, between what I do and what I can um, either assist in or learn about. I, I learn about new initiatives that Brookline is offering all the time, and many times I, I use that wonderful information. 
So some of the initiatives that we work on in Wellesley are also very important in Brookline. So mental health issues um, across the age spectrum is a very large um, focus area um, for both communities. Um, so Brookline works diligently um, on many different facets of mental health wellness, um, working with different organizations in the community as well as in the public school system. It's just, it's, it's a wonderful relationship that the schools have with the town departments um, and other organizations. Um, I also work on emergency preparedness initiatives and as Bruce noted, we have a wonderful um, uh, leader in Brookline, Don Sibber. And so um, there is a, a wonderful collaboration with resident advocates who um, not only work on emergency preparedness in the town and help out at flu clinics and at the marathon and whenever they're asked, but now there are new initiatives to try to get them involved in other town initiatives. So it's, it's a way to engage the residents and um, what started <coughs> off as emergency preparedness only and is now just moving in all kinds of wonderful directions. So those are two areas, mental health, emergency preparedness, that I'm involved in um, on a regular basis that I am also engaged in in Brookline. Questions for Ms. Leffman? Well, um, I don't think we can comment about your real job. I think Dr. <laughs> Cohen has <laughs> already said something. <laughs> but we are very uh, grateful that you are interested in volunteering in addition to what you do in your real, my real life. Thank so, you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Could, I, could, I, could I kind of turn the question around? You, Absolutely. You indicated that there were um, initiatives that we took in Brookline that you carried to Wellesley. Are there mm -hmm. initiatives in Wellesley that you've been able to bring to Brookline? Hmm, maybe some of the community health workshops. Um, a, a very good friend of mine um, also works in Brookline and we, do, we have very similar functions. We both work on community health initiatives. So we have bandied ideas back and forth. So I've learned about you know, the food and nutrition initiatives here that I've taken back to Wellesley. We've, we've had a, a fair, uh, something called Harvest Your Health Fair in Wellesley that um, Brookline has, it has had a, a very similar kind of day in the Brookline day. Mm -hmm. there, there are all kinds of wonderful workshops that we've hosted in Wellesley um, having to do with different types of um, brain health, focused around nutrition, um, we had one last year that some of the Brookline folks attended um, for women in midlife, and it was eye-opening, it was funny, it was well attended, and so those are some of the initiatives that we hosted in Wellesley that Brookline has also been interested in, and okay. they've offered as well. In so a similar which, fashion. Which community has a better health director? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't I think that's an allowed question. <laughs> I'm in Brookline and I'm a resident in Brookline, so I'm going to say Allen. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. Okay. We have well, a wonderful director in Wellesley. <laughs> my, my suspicion is that we are both, both communities are yeah. very fortunate to have uh, the high quality folks who are working in their health departments. Thank and you. we all I, I benefit so, from it. I, think I anyway, wonder if when you're in Wellesley, you have a different answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> they they do a, an amazing work in Wellesley, too. They no, don't. you qualified it. You yeah. said that you're <laughs> right. your answer tonight was. <laughs> exactly. Well done. Thank you. Okay. Any um, we Any other questions? No. Um, thank you very much for your continued interest. We'll My be um, not making appointments tonight, sure. but you will hear from us in writing. Thank okay? you so much. Thank you. Um, and then we have a candidate for the Arts Commission. Yep. Oh, no, Whoops. No oh, wait. Ms. Stoddard. Oh, Ms. Stoddard. Sorry, 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 sorry. Missed you. But we don't have... I don't yes. Have. yes. It's here. Yeah. Betsy, it get her? It's, it's attached, it's, it's attached to the back. All right. Sorry. Um, 
really <laughs> a little disorganized here. Welcome, Ms. Stoddard, and tell us about yourself and why you're interested in joining the council. Yes, uh, thank you so much. So I'm Gretchen Stoddard, and um, I'm currently the program officer at the Boston-based um, International Public Health Foundation, uh, the Izumi Foundation. But prior to that, I um, was doing my MPH, Master of Public Health, at Boston University uh, with a concentration in maternal and child health. Um, and upon graduating, I did receive this position in international health, which I do truly enjoy, but I'm also looking for ways to really be involved and hopefully help shape my local and community public health. I was lucky enough to have Dr. Balsam as a professor when I was at BU, and he, of course, did an excellent job of um, getting me excited about Brookline public health. Um, I've been a resident of Brookline for about three years and have recently purchased a condo here, so I know I'm going to be Ooh. here for quite a That's while. That's a commitment. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, which I'm very excited about. Uh, so when I saw this opportunity um, in the Brookline tab, I actually just wanted to uh, submit my application. Okay, well, um, you have been hearing something about the work that our council does, so I am guessing that you feel familiar with it, and it sounds as though your background is a good fit. Um, what I can say, and really what you heard me say to Dr. Cohen earlier, is that there aren't any vacancies right now. Mm -hmm. Um, but there might be other opportunities that could be possible, and I, I'm just giving you this information. We're not making decisions at the moment. Oh, but yeah, I don't no, want I you to be. Um, and yeah, and Dr. Balsam also talked to me okay. about this. We discussed it a little bit. He uh, um, also said, you know, if this appointment weren't to work out, I could um, become a part of the Board of Friends of Brookline Public Health. I've also uh, been in contact with Don Sabor about the uh, Brookline MRC. The MRC, Things like that. right. Um, right. The so plenty of, I understand there's many of opportunities. opportunities. Yeah, yes, exactly. okay, all right, just as long as you understand. Great. Questions, yes. Yeah, I just daily. wonder, since you were at BU, we, we have a sister city program here in Brookline, and our sister city is Quetzalcoatl and Nicaragua. And, I, and so some BU um, public health students have been working with our, our um, this is a citizen mm -hmm. um, volunteer okay. effort. And I just wondered if you'd been involved in that or? No, I haven't. You know. I actually uh, don't know very much about that. Uh, well, it might be something you'd yeah, be interested in because they have certainly have a lot of, um, uh, one, one of the, one of the parts of it I've been working on is trying to get them a working ambulance so the women who are in childbirth might be able to get to some help. But uh, <laughs> That would be excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. anyway. Okay, do we have Thank other you. questions for Ms. Stoddard? I'm, I'm actually a little curious okay. about the Izumi Foundation <laughs> that you're working sure. with. And the reason uh, I'm, I'm asking is my daughter had uh, done work on zoonotic diseases internationally. Okay. and. Okay. Um, I'm uh, curious about uh, what what the focus has been. Um, uh, she was in Kenya for a while. Uh, what what the African focus is in with this? Yeah, the Izumi Foundation. Foundation is actually a pretty unique foundation. It's Boston based and. The only office is in Boston, but we're actually a Japanese-funded and founded Buddhist foundation. Wow. Um, and so we have five areas that we concentrate in. It. Um, so that includes malnutrition, maternal and child health, um, infectious diseases, neglected tropical diseases, and healthcare infrastructure. So it's actually fairly broad, and they, of course, overlap. Um, those categories overlap. But uh, yeah, we in Kenya, we've done lots of um, well, various programs. Right now we are working with an organization that is doing work in postpartum hemorrhage prevention and treatment and uh, another group that's working in a neglected tropical disease, visceral leishmaniasis. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, I, um, I gather that you say you have a portfolio of 25 grants, so there is a, a wide spectrum of work that the organization is doing. Yes, definitely. Terrific. Well, um, I, I certainly believe that you would be a great addition to the council. Um, we're really grateful for your interest, and I'm hoping that a combination of doctors Balsam and Cohen will find some really exciting thing to keep you <laughs> occupied in Brookline. <laughs> Excellent, me too. <laughs> so, um, any other questions before we move on? Well, thank you very much for your interest. Yes, thank we'll you so much. hear from us in writing. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, 
And our next candidate is Ms. Cohen, who's uh, interested in the Arts Council. And I'm going to apologize to you. Somehow we did not get your background information in our packets tonight, oh. even though you were listed on the calendar. So I, I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been doing recently since we don't have any reference material. I'll give you a brief sort of resume <laughs> synopsis. Um, much of my work life until recently has actually been related to the arts. Um, I, uh, one of my first jobs out of college, which was a BA in art history, was actually running the wholesale department at the MFA for their retail operations. I was there for quite a while and stayed in museum work for a while. <coughs> Somehow ended up into other kinds of retail, but then eventually came full circle and opened my business in Coolidge Corner in 1995, which was Stone's Throw Gallery, which specialized in local artists, fine arts, jewelry, ceramics. I know, I think that's where I met Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> I was a customer. I'm not giving anything away. Great, great store. <laughs> Um, that was open in Coolidge Corner from 1995 to 2003. At one point during that time, um, the Coolidge Corner Arts Festival, which is about to go into, I think, its 37th year, was, um, I think I came on board when it was in its 20th or 21st year when Joanne Milbury, who had been doing it from the beginning, moved to the Cape. And so I've been involved with that for lo those many years. Um, have moved on career-wise in another direction, but have been able to keep my hand in the arts and involvement and enjoyment of the arts <laughs> by doing the Arts Festival. And as Betsy knows, um, recently have been trying to put together um, an arts month for the town of Brookline by bridging the period of time between the um, Brookline Open Studios, which runs the last month of April, to the Coolidge Corner Arts Festival, which is the first weekend in June, and finding a way to bridging that in an umbrella organization that would promote all the arts in town, performing arts, fine arts, et cetera. Um, and that's what led me to the Arts Commission, thinking they, along with perhaps the Chamber of Commerce, might be good organizations to be presenters of that month. Um, and as a matter of fact, met this evening with the commission to get their blessing to be part of, uh, be a co-sponsor, presenter of the Arts Month. What okay, like that sounds good and qualified <laughs> and interested. Um, and actually, uh, well, go ahead. Slight yeah, I just want to comment that I think Leah has done a tremendous job with the Coolidge Corner Arts Festival. Thank you. And it really is I, a, a pr high quality event. I can't take all credit. We have a, a small group of private individuals, some business owners who have been doing it for these many years and it's definitely a labor of love. Mm -hmm. And I think the notion of an Arts Week, um, month. or month, sorry, Arts Month, uh, I'm sort of, I have my head on the climate, week, <laughs> but um, the, um, the idea of linking a number of events together mm -hmm. and also having coordinated uh, publicity and that sort of thing um, has a, um, a way of strengthening each of the component parts, I would hope. Agreed, and, and there's gonna be a lot of cross promotion. Mm -hmm. I think um, even for starting this year without adding new events. I think we can make do with existing events. There's um, between open studios and the Arts Festival, for instance, um, the Brookline Symphony Orchestra has a concert in May. There are a lot of other things going on in that time period that hopefully we can link together and promote. Well, and um, it, it would be really nice I know that the Open Studios uh, folks usually organize a map with a list of where all the events are. It would be mm -hmm. really, really nice to see something that covered the whole month, um, you know, in, in time for mm -hmm. everybody to sort of plan, think well, about where to go and what to do. Peg O'Connell, who's now running the Open Studios, she's taken over from Gwen Austin for it. So it was, she came to me oh, right. a couple months ago and said, you know, I'm doing Open Studios now, would love to talk because mm -hmm. you do the Arts Festival and that sort of when it came together like, oh, let's do something together. Well, and, and now that Gwen is at the Teen Center, you want to hold an event at the Teen Center. There you go. Do. <laughs> right. Okay. Other questions for Ms. Cole? Just a comment. There are a few people in town as dedicated and as give as much as, as Leah does. She's you, extra Ken. extraordinarily well qualified for, for this. I don't have any questions. But. Thank you, Ken. Yes, and I, I do that. happen to know there are vacancies on the Arts Commission, well, even though... Well, uh, I learned that as... Yeah. In finding out about the commission to talk to them about the Arts Month is when right. I learned they had vacancies. Right, right. So I'm, I'm fairly confident you will be appointed. Uh, but not, uh, it's not on our calendar for tonight. You'll hear from us uh, eventually in writing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity tonight. Great. Thanks very much for your 
continued interest. Why don't, why, don't, why don't you go to the microphone? If you would come to the microphone and, and, and maybe I, you could start again. Identify yourself for the record. My name is Scott Murphy. I live at 160 Chestnut Street. I'm the father of two children, Ayla Murphy, who is dressed as uh, select board of selectmen. I, I, don't, I don't think we need to know more okay. than that, just mm -hmm. for and the Carson, record. Carson, who's a freshman at the high yeah. school, and their mother uh, served as uh, uh, administrator for the Heirs Commission and a school bus monitor for Perkins for the Blind when she died. Uh, she, she was pronounced dead January 18th. 2007, and so she worked for both town and school, and um, and she was with the Arts Commission, I think, for about four or five years. Yes. And so yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I just want to say I remember Andrea. Yes, well, and I and do she, remember uh, Andrea, and what she did do one of the of things I remember work. about her is a wonderful tree full of um, of objects that was standing in the town hall lobby that she mm -hmm. put together. So. Um, all right, moving on to the audit committee. Um, Selectman Daly, are you going to sure, I will kick it off. take it, kick it, kick it, push it, <laughs> get it rolling? Well, uh, I am uh, Nancy Daly, obviously, a member of the Board of Selectmen, and um, I'm also chairman of the audit committee. And I want to say I was delighted when one of my fellow selectmen earlier tonight said, oh, the audit report, great, the most exciting meeting of the year. Thank you, <laughs> Selectman Goldstein. I think so, he too. Has, he has a great sense of irony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is, it is pretty interesting. Anyway, I want to first say that the other, me I want to say the names of the other members of the audit committee because it's a good group and they pay a lot of attention to this stuff that some people may find dull. So it's Greg Grobstein, Jim Littleton, Peter Flaherty, they're the moderator's appointees. Ben Chang represents the school committee. Lee Selwyn represents the advisory committee. And ex officio members are Steve Cirillo, our finance director, Michael DiPietro, our controller, Peter Rowe, deputy superintendent of schools, and Sean Cronin, deputy town administrator. Um, so the, um, the uh, basically we got a good report again this year. Um, no, um, no problems um, other than there were, there, as always, there were some areas where the auditors point out to us that we could probably improve things. I will say one of the good uh, pieces of the report this year was that a lot of the prior year ones, sometimes the prior year ones kind of hang on for a while, and we seem to have, you know, cleared up a lot of them this time, and we had a couple new ones. Um, we, I will mention that... Um, our, our assets, uh, as of the end of the June 30th, 2013, the close of the, the fiscal year, were $319,447,079. And of that, $78,843,375 uh, was cash. Now, I just want to say something about that and cash equivalents, because we've had some um, questions in the past of, well, if you've got 78 million in cash, why can't you just, um, you know, use that for other things? Um, but that is basically uh, for upcoming payroll to pay bills on which spending has already been committed. Some of it would be funds that are already designated to go into our trust funds. Um, so that is not um, money that's just available to put to other uses. Um, I, I w in general, uh, I, I will say the auditors were complimentary about our staff and Michael DiPietro, who came in partway through the, the year, um, and things still worked very smoothly, even with the changeover. And um, the OPEBs, we continue to make progress on our OPEB liability. Um, we hope to get to the ARC, which would be the annual required contribution, um, in 2023. And I think... I think, Steve, when we, you say that, you mean getting to, it would be an arc for a 30-year um, uh, attempt to fully fund that. So what we do hope is that at some, some point with, when the um, 
pension fund is fully funded, that the um, money would then, that had been going toward pensions, would then be moved over to the OPEB. So we still are ahead of many other cities and towns in addressing that liability. Um, the uh, the, the uh, auditors, as I said, did not find any material weaknesses, which is a term of art that they use, so that, that means things are pretty good. Um, since, uh, since our last meeting, um, there was, uh, as you know, an issue in the um, transportation department with some relatively small cash receipts. I'm going to let Steve handle any questions, if anyone has any on those. I will say that I had some suggestions, um, and I'm sure others did as well, and that, that seems to be uh, getting worked into the plan to address that. So um, I, 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 and I will now introduce um, everybody from the audit team. Let me see where I... I had everyone's name written down so I wouldn't um, screw up on this, but nice. <laughs> okay, here we go. Partners Richard Sullivan, who's Richard's right here, uh, Craig Peacock, and Dennis Cohane, and I'm sorry I don't know the young lady's name, but what is it? Haley Finos. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over right now to Richard, and uh, unless anyone, I think probably it's best if you hold the questions. And, Totally sure. You do a very good job already. So, um, <laughs> the idea that of what I try to do when I come before you folks is to just give you an idea of the process, so that you can understand it, how the audit went. Um, not just from some of the uh, things that Nancy mentioned, which we considered a good audit, but I want you to understand that to make sure that the tires were kicked and you you received an audit that you're supposed to receive. Um, when Nancy was talking about the amount of cash and investments. Some of those investments, cash investments, were just what we would call the general government. Didn't include OPEB, didn't include the pension plan, it didn't include some of the library trusts that are associated with the, um, uh, the balance sheet itself. In total, the town and we audited $359 million worth of cash, and that includes the pension plan. And because cash is probably the most liquid asset and probably the most volatile, we spend a lot of time on it and we make sure it's right. And the way we go about the audit, which I think has been a very efficient thing that I think we implemented maybe five or six years ago, Steve, is the, uh, the cash is tied up and, and pretty much reconciled when we come in to do the audit in the beginning of August. And most of the time we're not able to do that with a lot of clients. So we're able to take a big part of this audit and get it done what we call a preliminary phase. In August we also look at long-term debt because it's usually all been taken care of. We also look at the budget because that was taken care of many years, many moons ago, uh, many months ago, better the way to say it. And we look at a lot of things that we try to get done that don't all come when we come out to do the second phase of the audit, which is in September. Being able to accomplish the cash audit at that point in time is very significant for us because you have other assets we have to look at. You've got $298 million worth of capital assets. That does include the enterprise funds. You've got $75 million worth of debt. Um, you've got the OPEB liability, the landfill liability, comp abs. These are all other elements of your balance sheet that we've got to make sure are correctly presented and nailed down tight, which is what we do as part of our audit. We also look at um, what I call the cyclical transactions of the town, the payroll cycle, the disbursement cycle, the revenue cycle, and we also test for what we call journal entries. Um, because journal entries, while sometimes are part of your standard operating procedures, also journal entries are used to correct things. And if we see types of journal entries that are being used to correct things on a regular basis, that implies that there could be a design issue as a result of the transaction. Uh, what I can share with you is when we looked at those hundred and two, well, over 200 different transactions, we thought that they were properly authorized, properly recorded, they were accurate, and from the journal entry side, we didn't see anything that I would highlight for you as being a systematic problem that we would be concerned with, and if we were concerned, we would share with you. Um, when we look at deliverables, field work ended September 20th. I thought it was actually a pretty good schedule that we went on. Uh, drafts were issued October 3rd. We had a, what is called a management letter meeting, which means we sit down with Steve, the treasurer, some of the school folks to go over the comments that we I presented in the report to you. And we also met with the audit committee on November 25th. And Nancy, that is a good committee. Uh, there's a lot of strong people there. 
I tend to really want to be on my toes when I come into that room because there's some heavy duty hitters there. Um, the overall results. I used to call it an unqualified opinion. Now it's called an unmodified opinion. There's been some language changes in the, in the standards. But you have a, uh, the best opinion that the town can get as a result, as a result of an um, audit. Um, reporting deadlines were met. At least they were met in my estimation and certainly audit committees. Uh, when we re asked for information, we received it timely and we received it accurately. Uh, we come in and there's certain things we have to do every year. Let's say the old 80-20 rule. 80% of what we're going to do we'll probably have to do, like audit cash. But we also have a, what's called professional skepticism. And that means that we come in and for that other 20% we ask questions or try to ask questions that weren't asked in prior years or certainly not in the year just uh, preceding. The idea behind that is to see what the reaction is of the folks we're asking the question of. And what I can share with you is that um, we didn't see any issues in terms of delay of coming up with a timely explanation or a timely answer to the information we requested. And as Nancy mentioned, we believe there's no internal control issues, no material weaknesses, or significant deficiencies. Um, and if you want to, we can talk about the transportation thing a little bit in terms of how that fits into that. But when we're looking at, for instance, an audit base that has hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of assets, we, we look at materiality, and what I'm sharing with you when I say that is it's based on the materiality levels that we feel there are no issues that you should be concerned with at this time. A couple of financial highlights. The general fund, and has consistently done so, showed a profit this year, just under a million dollars. Your unreserved fund balance, which I think is terrific, is about $20 million, or just over 9% of your total budget. Um, Included, not included in that, but has to be added to that number is your stabilization fund. That was $5.8 million. So when you combine those two, you're looking at about $12 million worth of uh, reserves set aside as a percentage of your appropriation. That is one of the reasons why you have a AAA rating. Because the GFOA looks at things and said, the bottom, the lowest you should be at five. When you start creeping to the nines and into the double digits, you're managing your, your business. You're, you're, you're managing the, the town in a way that the GFOA and the financial folks there look to see what's good, prudent financial management. And that's reflective of it. Um, I've had the chance to be involved in some meetings as well as read the significant reserve policies you have. The fact that you have that much money set aside is reflective of the amount of effort that went into creating those policies. Um, the other thing that what I call is your operations are structurally sound. Um, your revenues are reasonably budgeted and they came in a little bit higher by about 1.9% and expenditures came in 2% lower. Now, on a crystal ball basis, that means you've got a 98%, which is pretty good. But that does add to the, sus be able, the ability to be able to sustain incrementally increasing your reserves over time as well as meeting the service levels that you want to meet as a community. And um, similar to prior years, your real estate and personal property taxes collections are excellent. You collect 99% of everything you bill in the first year it's, the bill goes out, which is better than a lot of other communities out there. The enterprise funds, when you look at the water and sewer operations, the golf operations, they showed profits this year also. The water a little more than normal because there's an MW, MWRA project going on there and they received a significant grant related to that. But their operations, you, you want them to be self-sustaining. You also allocate a lot of costs associated with them, like the OPEB, like pension and so <coughs> forth, and they're still able to sustain or show a profit from those operations, which I think is significant and helps the general fund maintain a reserve level that you want to maintain. The pension fund net assets went up about $18 million after expenditures, totally reflective of the market and the things that have been changing, which I think are probably even better when you see the next valuation. Um, OPEB, you have $16 million set aside right now for your cash and investments to meet the OPEB liability. You're about $45 million short as of this date. But what we're seeing and the way that you're going to approach it, what did you say, 2023? That's when the, the arc will be met, which means the payment we're supposed to make that year will in fact be 100% made. There'll still be an increase in the liabilities at that point. But then thereafter, what the plan is, based on, and if everything goes well, is you intend to increase the appropriations beyond the arc, and you're going to have the ability to consider at some point in time for a period of six or seven years when your pension liability drops off, 
what you're going to do with OPEB. And that could be, that's going to be a decision that occurs at that time, but it's a, it's a, it's a flexible budgetary maneuver that you have available coming to you later on when the pension liability goes away. Capital assets, just to talk about it briefly. Um, the general fund spent about $7 million in uh, increasing capital, infrastructure, uh, capital structures, primarily the Runkle and Heath schools. That's where most of the money went. Water and sewer had the MWA, MWRA project, which is where all that money went. And the Gulf Fund spent $100,000 on a clubhouse and some improvements to the maintenance building. On debt, it was about $13 million issued in FY13. Most of that, well, 6.8 of it, I'm sorry, 5.6 of it was new money. What I mean by new money is that it was used specifically to fund the Runkle School. Um, but you also had an advance refunding, which is kind of like a refinance of your home, your home mortgage. That's, that refinancing, which was $6.8 million, is going to save $530,000 in debt service over the remaining life of the bonds, which is, I think, is significant. Anytime you can take advantage of something like that, it shows that your folks are paying attention, as you would hope they would do. Other observations. One of the things that I'd like to note is that your debt service is a very, what I would call a very comfortable 4.4% of your budget. Um, and the only reason I mention that is I know that you're considering some other things that are coming down the line, such as I think it was the Devotion School project. Um, I know that that's going to be an increase to your debt service, but be comfortable knowing 4.4% is a pretty low number um, when you look at all the other communities out there. And if you talk to the GFOA, they would actually say about 8% is probably a good number to have the, for debt. Now, the difference with you and what the GFOA says, and we see a lot of communities, is you build an incredible amount of capital improvements into your operating budget yearly. So you're, paying, you're doing a pay-as-you-go basis. I can't tell you off the top of my head what that means in terms of the total number, but you do have what I would call um, flexibility and the amount of debt service that you're incurring right now. And that's for future considerations for the type of things, things like the devotion school. Um, another observation before, as I move from the report, is you come as close to issuing a CAFR as most of any other community out there. You have a, the first 14 pages of your report. What was, what was that term? I'm sorry, comprehensive annual, annual financial report. Okay. It's a report that brings into a lot of uh, other elements that aren't in a standard report issued under GASB 34. And your transmittal letter and your MDNA are two of the best sections of the report that if you're not a financial person but you want to understand what's going on in this town, they're very well written. They communicate to the reader. You do not have to be a CPA. You do not have to be a finance person to understand the initiatives that are going on here, the successes that have occurred, and what you're thinking for the future challenges you have. And I just had the highlights I have here are five. Your capital improvement program, well explained. Your long-term financial planning, well explained. You talk about the issues related to your post-employment benefits issues, cash man management policies, and initiatives like the override study that you're having done, and performance management, which is, I think, um, creeping into your FY14 budget process. That's good stuff. That's the kind of things that I, if I was reading your report, trying to get an idea of what this town is about, I think it's worth reading. Uh, I think it's well written. And um, I also think that that contributes to the fact that the town has a AAA rating. Um, that's my comments on the report. What I usually do is just go into the federal wards, talk about the management letter, and then open up the questions unless you'd like to change that. Go ahead. Thank you. All right. Um, the federal At wards. some of us start with the management letter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like to us. leave that to last because, um, but um, on the federal awards piece, you're, it's, this is a quick uh, comment. You spend $6.1 million with the federal funds in fiscal 13, which means you're required to have what they call an A133 audit, and we have to test the grants at least the expenditures greater than 25 percent. We took the special education cluster, which is a, a series of grants all related to special education, and that represented 33 percent of your expenditures. We tested for compliance, and we also tested for proper expenditures as they're, as they're charged to the grant for authorization, type, etc. cetera. Um, what I'm here to share with you is there were no question costs, which means there wasn't one expenditure that we determined should not have been charged to that grant. There were two findings, and they're kind of administrative findings. There's a reporting process and a reconciliation process that has to occur 
between the funds, the uh, sorry, the records maintained at the school level and the record maintained at the town level. And what we highlighted in our in our uh, letter was that there could be a better job of doing this. Um, so that was the, the finding there. But again, it didn't re uh, result in a question cost, so there were no issues relative to the amount of money that was spent. On the management letter, and Nancy noted this, we had nine comments from the prior year, five of which were fully resolved. Of the four that were unresolved, they are fraud risk assessment, which there has been an ass assessment and analysis done of various departments, and our net last part of that comment is those, um, that assessment and analysis should be documented. So if that, once that documentation occurs, this comment would go away. We recommended there be an audit of the um, student activity funds. There's an annual review done of them by the school, but Chapter 71 and MASBO best practices recommend at least on a three-year basis an independent audit be done. Um, my understanding is um, that in FY14, this is going to be coordinated and, and be uh, taken care of, so I'm hoping that this will also be resolved come the FY14 audit. We also highlighted the fact of the basically the finding that was done in the Federal Awards Report. And the reason we highlighted that also in the management letter because it's the second year it's happened. And we just think that it was worthwhile mentioning because two years in a row, we're not used to having the town of Brookline not at least do something two years in a row. And we wanted to highlight that as part of our management letter. And then in the school departments, a significant number of revolving funds occur. Now we didn't find anything really that was an issue relative to the expenditure of the funds, the receipt of the funds. But one thing we don't see is a formal process of understanding or consistent application of how receipts are uh, recorded, how they're <coughs> processed, what kind of expenditures can occur. And we think that there should be policies and procedures relative to the revolving funds that would be, say, blanket across all revolving funds and then specific to individual funds. And we are recommending that something like that be formalized and documented. Those are the highlights of the prior four, what we call unresolved or partially resolved comments. We then introduced two new comments this year. One relates to sick and accrued, I'm sorry, sick and vacation time. When we were auditing the amount of what they call compensated absences, what the liability would be on your book should somebody be terminated, there was not a consistency between what we interpreted to be the union contracts and what was being presented on the schedule that we were auditing. And the evolution of our questions and analytics led us to believe that sometimes people are paid more than contractually they're supposed to due to past practices. And the thought process here is let's get consistent. If, you're, if, if, it, if there should be more amount paid or more amount accrued, then that should be reflective in the documents that we're re required to look at to assess the amount of the liability and whether it's stated correctly. The last part of it also was related to some accounting for grants in which um, their expenditures were charged to the grants that were estimated. And um, for purposes of our process, as well as it relates to grants, the only thing that should be charged to a grant is a bill that really exists or an expenditure that's actually been paid. And that's why that comment's in there. Now, the management letter obviously is critical in nature. <laughs> it doesn't really give anybody a pat on the back or say the things that we think are going well. What I can reflect with, uh, share with you is that this is not a large management letter. Um, again, it does not have the term significant deficiencies or material weakness, which is something you would not want to hear. But they are comments that we thought are worthy of sharing with you uh, for ho hopefully better enhancement to internal controls and or operations. Okay, um, may I suggest that we begin um focus on just the uh, report and management letter if you want to get to the subsequent event. Treat that separately. Can we do that? Just to kind of keep things clean. Um, I, I have a general question um, having to do with our various uh, databases. I think I'm going to use in a more generic way. Um, I know that there are different um, data set systems used in different departments. I know we've been working hard to get them to interact s together, and I'm wondering if you have any observations about that at all. It, my observations I think I'm going to share with you might be somewhat limited, but I do know that there's a, um, the 
application or the use of the municipal applications is becoming stronger and stronger within the town. Um, I believe they just went through a payroll conversion for Munis. And Munis has the capacity to provide HR services and, and our HR applications and things like that. And my understanding is that is a migration. We probably do not spend as much time specifically looking at maybe at a particular database at the school because it's, it's programmatic and even though it involves operations of the school, it's probably not as critical in terms of the financial position of the, of the town. Um, when we see, if I could share with you, if I, we see something that's contradictory or doesn't work, we'll let you know. I mean, we've done some, we've done uh, site visits at the school. We've looked at the uh, food processing and the swipe card system there to determine how that works. Um, we are not aware, at least to any great degree, of any significant inconsistencies in data. Um, and pretty much things, if they have to migrate, eventually migrate to the immune system, the conversion process is usually fairly efficient and reasonable. Um, but I don't, I can't sit here in front of you that I understand all the different databases within the town. Okay, thank you. Other questions, members of the board? Yes. Yeah. Dr. Goldstein. Um, well, I have a few questions. Um, on the A133 report, first of all, um, I, I, you explained a little bit about uh, the questions that you uh, had about the failure to reconcile between the um, the uh, general ledger and the and the uh, expenditures reported, but you know when I hear failure to reconcile, alarm bells go off in my head and can, can e ease my mind on it. Are there this is are we're there not monetary discrepancies or or just the way things are classified? I, Let's say it's a little bit of both, but when you say monetary discrepancies, I really have to pull that words, back a little does bit. The, does the, do, the, uh, do the numbers not, are all the dollars not there? Are there deficits no, in the accounts? It's, it's not an issue of the dollars not being there. Is that there's a reporting process that goes directly from the school to the federal government, and there's a reporting process that then has to be reconciled with Munis. There are timing issues that I understand that should be, that are part of that process, but those timing issues are not being identified and correctly reflected as of a point in time, i.e. June 30th. The school eventually gets to the point where everything is reconciled, but it occurs after year end. And it sometimes occurs even after our audit is concluded. It's our contention that that should not be taking place. It should be taking place on a contemporaneous basis and doesn't require, let's say, some looking back to see if something should have been charged here or not been charged there. As a general rule, we've seen that the financial reports provided to the federal government are fairly stated and not requiring much adjustment, but Munis should also ref or mirror that information at any time during this process, and that has not been occurring. So it's not like money's missing. Um, it's more, I don't want to, it's kind of a timing issue, and also um, a little bit of a issue rel relative to paying attention to the, 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 the process of what's happening at the school level, on a programmatic level, on school records, and what should be also in the Munis records at the same time. Okay. I had a uh, similar reaction at the, at the management letter, letter when you talked about uh, under the category basis of accounting, and it said uh, that uh, in some respect we weren't following the uniform municipal accounting system. You explained in your comments a few minutes ago that this really had to do with Paying of estimates, I think, is how you said it? Recording or, uh, estimates. Recording estimates? Recording estimates so, to it. You've got to explain to me. So recording estimates, it sounds to me like paying estimates. Uh, <laughs> no, um, how do I want to say this? When there was a closeout of, the, of a particular grant, um, there were some amounts reported in the grant um, that had not been paid, nor were their bills reflective of to be paid meaning accounts payable. So either you pay it or it's an accounts payable, and that in, in terms makes it an expenditure. There was an estimate thrown into the report, and that estimate ultimately was paid, but it was just an estimate at a point in time, and we're just, um, we, I guess the way, best way to say it is that there's, we don't think estimates should ever be used. Um, you either have a true liability or a true expenditure, and that's the only two things that should be reflected. 
in, a, um, in Munis and or um, on a federal grant report. And so what happened here was is that they knew they were going to spend the money. Um, it was ultimately spent, but it was shown as a, as part of our work that we were doing, we came across it and it was shown as a real expenditure, as if it was a real expenditure when it had not yet been incurred. I see. Okay. So it was sort of a placeholder that somebody had, had inserted. That's a fair way to say it. Okay. Got it. Uh, one last question. Uh, can you talk about the uh, problem in special education accounting and, and uh, the failure to reconcile on uh, there as well? That, that gets back to that time, basically a timing thing. Um, it's, it's getting Munis to mirror the information that's being presented to the federal government and being reported at the school level. Um, Ultimately, it gets reconciled, but it shouldn't be recon a June 30th reconciliation should not be occurring in November, and that's the essence of what we're, we were saying there. And it ultimately gets taken care of. I know the school and, and Mike worked together to get actually get to that point, but we're of the, uh, the thought process that that should be occurring at least contemporaneously, monthly, and certainly at June 30th, we should be able to say, see what's in the um, what's well, being shown at the grant level, or the, let's call it the program level, and that should mirror what the information that's in Munis. Okay. And that, the, this comment reflects the fact that that was not occurring. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Selectman Benka. No, I, um, I guess my question is, have, have any of the comments <coughs> from prior years appeared for more than one year at this point? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, I don't know the answer yeah. to that. The fraud risk has kind of evolved. I think that's one that's been, and that's not inconsistent uh, with a lot of uh, our communities because it's a pretty sizable comment, meaning that when you want a fraud risk assessment, it's not something that tends to happen overnight. Um, I was, I like the fact that it was what I consider to be significant progress related to it. And our comments to Mike were that, you know, after he had gone around and he's got notes that we would somehow formalize it so you folks could be aware of it too. Um, but to some degree, most of the time, these things have come and gone within, let's say, two fiscal audits. Okay. Yeah, well, the fraud risks just seem to be a matter of documenting what's already happened. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly, because you, you came up with a fraud policy right away, which was step one. Then the other part was going in and looking at the various departments and to try to determine what the risk were, what the mitigating factors were, and was that sufficient. And pretty much that has occurred. And that tends to be an ongoing process too. As auditors, and what we do recommend is that that be documented. And that's what the last part of this comment is all about. Okay. Thank you. Yes, like my wishes. Uh, this is probably more a comment. Uh, in my uh, day job, I've heard a lot of audits and um, mo most of them that I've, that I've that I've heard and participated in have have been a very different tone I hear a very positive tone and, and you know that says a lot for the way the town is managed and I think it's great what I'd be interested in you know going forward is just hearing and I don't it's probably not for this meeting but just some of the things we're going to be doing to clear up some of the you know, management issues. Follow up, you mean? Right. Yes. Uh, the issues don't seem to be major, um, but they're there, and mm -hmm. we can improve, and we yeah. should. Well. I, th I think management's comments in there, um, and also with the influence of the audit committee, that there tends to be a sense of urgency to correct these things. And um, unless I'm missing something, I, I think pretty much all of management's comments were fairly positive relative to a resolution of FY14. So. Um, that's our anticipation, our expectations going to the next audit. Selectman so Bangkok. Yeah, if, if we've left the management letter for a minute, I, um, and, and this may not be um, really um, in your bailiwick, but I continue to be amazed that um, uh, the ongoing OPEB liabilities are not something that have really taken hold yet in uh, in uh, bond ratings, uh, municipal bond ratings. Um, you know, we're one of a handful of the 351 communities in Massachusetts, and there's a passing reference to it. Um, uh, but 
out of those 351 communities, I think, what, three, four, five have actually taken steps to start funding them, maybe a few more at this point. There may be a few more, but... Yeah. Um, and, and, yet, and yet it really hasn't, uh, hasn't risen to the level of uh, affecting ratings. And I'm wondering if there's any skinny on the street as to uh, uh, whether uh, that situation is likely to continue or, or whether um, there's becoming an increasing awareness of this issue. I'm going to give you my crystal ball because I don't know how really have a skinny on the street. Um, I'm going to give it about five years, certainly no more than ten, where uh, communities like yourself are addressing this issue. Uh, there are others out there, those AAA communities, of which is 16 of you in uh, Massachusetts. Um, other people, the people like your folks who are taking the lead in this, the, the rating agencies are going to begin judging others based on the standards that folks like you are setting. And I think it's going to be reflective in their ratings. I think that there's going to be uh, folks that are saying you have to have a plan and you have to start showing something relative to that plan. Um, I think a lot of the communities are saying to the rating agencies right now that once we get our pension taken care of, we'll take care of this. I think that's probably pacifying them at the moment. I don't think it's going to last for, for that much longer. I just don't. Um, because this is, this is looming. I mean, you made some design changes even. You saved about $133 million just by going to the GIC and doing some other things. Um, I think if there's communities out there that aren't even doing that, they're going to be looked at and less favorably than they had been in the past. So my horizon is five years, maybe ten, but it's going to hit the fan. It's, there's no doubt about it because this is a real liability. It wasn't something that Gatsby came up with. I was going to say, it's not a local issue. This is national. This is national. It's statewide. I mean, I don't have the answers, but I know that what you've done to mitigate some of the issues, particularly for the overall unfunded liability, and the fact that you've got, a, I would consider, an aggressive plan to take care of it, um, that's something that only a handful of communities have right now. And I agree with you. I think it should be getting more attention right now. I just don't think anybody, even the rating agencies, are willing to put everybody in the same bucket and, and try to reflect detrimentally on that right now. Because we just we've just come out of a tremendous issue with the state, and you know when you look at all the the, the, the shortages of the state money that's come in uh, happened over the last ten years. Um, we had we've had a couple of good years overall um, from an economic standpoint, but for the three or four years prior to that, we were barely making payroll. If you really think about it, for some of the communities out there, I mean, I mentioned to you folks that you had nine percent of your general fund um, in reserves. I have clients that had 0.9 percent of the general fund in reserves. So um, I'm not sure if that's an answer, but that's, that's the way I'm thinking right now in the five to 10 year I just, horizon. I wanted, I wanted to get your sense. <laughs> I, I sit here amazed every year yep. that yeah. it, it, hasn't, it hasn't hit yet. You, you know what's amazing too is that you're seeing, this, the, the Wall Street Journal's commenting about this. You're seeing this on, on some of the financial news networks about all of this. Um, this isn't something that's all of us, you know, this crazy accounting thing, the gizmo they came up with. This is a real liability. And um, if not dealt with, it's going to structurally bankrupt a lot of communities, counties, right. et cetera. Thank you. Um, I have a, a sort of a detailed follow-up to that. Where in the fund, um, I know that there are, when I think of, restricted funds and unrestricted funds, I, I have a slightly different set of definitions, and I know you have you've defined non-spendable, restricted, committed, and assigned. What sure. I would like to know is where's our 9 percent? When, when I look in the fund balances, which of those, those categories actually cover what you consider to be our undesignated reserves as opposed to any of those other words I just read off? The, it's essentially, in unassigned, it shows $25.8 million. And I think okay, you're so looking at page 65? Yeah, I Okay. Am. That's where it is. Inclusive in that is the $5.8 million of the stabilization money. Right. So in mm -hmm. essence, if you back out the stabilization, just from the standpoint of the way we talk, the, talk about that UMIS accounting, right. that's where I came up with the $20 million, or It's actually $19.9 .9 million of general fund, unreserved fund balance. Okay. And 
because of the new rule, GASB 54, they require that you combine the stabilization fund with the used to be the unreserved general fund for presentation on the financial statements. Okay, but in, in the statements, the tagline is unassigned. That's correct. Thank you. I use unreserved only because I think that's still how the accounting system works yeah. and how okay. you folks right. work it's when you think about I free cash. Wanted to be sure I understood that's Which? the first question I've ever got on this schedule in my life. That's great. <laughs> well, it proves I read it. How's that? <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions before we move on to our event? Um, then I, I guess um, we understand that the um, there was a cash issue in the transportation division and we understand that we've consulted with you folks and our controller and finance director and I gather from what I've read that everybody feels we have come up with a good solution but would you just sort of summarize the matter with regard to cash recording receipts and um, you know how the um, safeguards are now going to be in place? Or if you can't do it, we can I ask can, Mr. Cirillo. Maybe it should be Mr. Cirillo. <laughs> well, uh, I think I, it could be Mr. You Cirillo. Know what, before I leave, I'll just say sure. what I did is I read what Steve put together. Yeah. And, and I thought his, the analysis, the assessment, um, some of the assumptions he made, and I think I, I gave him a letter that basically said, I, I like what I saw. Okay. I mean, and, and I thought that the, there was sufficient uh, steps being taken to let's say mitigate, because you can never eliminate, to mitigate situations that like that occurred. As far as some of the details, I think Steve probably would be better okay. handling that. Well then, no, don't don't go quite yet. Are there any wrap-up comments that uh, any members would like to make before we uh, move from our audit report? No. Uh, I would just, just say, thank you. yeah, <laughs> thank you all. Thanks to the audit committee and um, thanks to the staff for the work they've done, and thank you for um, having added not that many new <laughs> comments in your uh, management. It's not because we don't try. Yeah, I so. know you do. I know you do. In fact, I know that you would not write one of those letters if you couldn't put some of those in. Yeah. So there, you would not be responsible, I suppose, from your perspective. But anyway, okay. all right. Anyway, thank, thank you very thank much. You. We thank appreciate you. it. So, Mr. Cirillo, would you just kind of outline the circumstances and the corrective actions? Well, the circumstances that uh, one of our employees, past employees, um, took uh, redirected funds to for his own use. Um, he was caught, he admitted to the error, he's been dismissed. Um, we have done a few analysis of this. The police conducted their own analysis along with the Public Works Commissioner. And then the Finance Department, Michael and I, uh, did a full assessment from a control review, and I believe you have that report right. uh, in your packet. Uh, the recommendations that we are making to you are, are simple. Uh, that uh, first from the software uh, point of view, uh, this so one piece of software uh, that uh, has been implemented in the town, it's not a financial software, it's a, it's a kind of an administrative software to manage permits, uh, should have some um, back-end controls on it, permissions on it, to restrict certain activities. And basically the best way to say it is to create uh, segregation of duty permissions within the software. So one staff would be assigned for the primary use of creating a permit and say a supervisor would be assigned uh, the, uh, the permission to change, edit, or delete that action rather than having all of that vested in one employee. That's, that's the primary rec recommendation we would uh, make. Second of all, we would uh, make a recommendation that uh, a numbered uh, uh, receipts be issued for all activities, not upon request. And third, we would, we have suggested to uh, all with, of- With a, and we're gonna keep a copy uh, of yes, the receipts. Yes, the, the, those receipts would have to go ultimately to the treasurer's office to make the proof that it has been received. And ultimately we'd recommend that uh, 
the line staff who are interacting with citizens, uh, users uh, of, of government services, uh, that we, we encourage uh, the use of uh, other methods of payment like credit cards or checks. Those are the three uh, recommendations we make in the overall uh, issue here. And I actually was interested to read that a paper receipt in this case beats out a data entry into electronic media. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, Old-fashioned uh, piece of paper with uh, writing on it. I, I love paper. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Electricity, not so much. Right. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> I would say that, uh, the, in fact, uh, the systems should be coordinated. Uh, uh, this, the software system is a good piece of software. It helps the line departments control all, all of their permits. And in fact, we, uh, the, the organization, are encouraging our line departments to use it more. Um, but certainly, um, the software uh, does not have some of the uh, controls on it that other pieces of software that uh, are financially related to. For instance, I'll give you an example of a good piece of software, the, uh, the recreation department and school department uses a software called RecTrack. And in every transaction that goes in there, it's, there's a back-end audit report that lists all of the transactions, all of the edits, and all of the deletes. This software that was used for permits didn't have that functionality. We are working with that software company to develop it, and they're very responsive to that issue. I believe they believe uh, Brookline is a uh, is uh, one of their premier clients, and they they want to do what they can to help. Okay, other questions, comments from members of the board? Yeah. Are, Second, are those are those software changes going to then track to the employee who has um, issued the permit and supposedly taken? We well, assume it's a cash. They certainly can. They certainly can. That 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 is done now. Uh, the the problem we have now is that there is no built-in segregation of duties. So um, an employee um, it can create a permit, edit or delete a permit, and or, excuse me, I should put that in past tense. Could create, edit, and delete a could uh, have. permit. Could have. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, it's. Uh, as of tomorrow, um, uh, our IT department is fanning out to all of the seven uses of this uh, software and putting those permissions uh, in place to segregate that responsibility. Steve, aren't all, uh, weren't all permits numbered and logged so that if, uh, as they're generated, it's logged in so that if, if a number is skipped, you could go back and establish well, what happened to the I story. believe that is the case, yes. Uh, but was, there, was there wasn't any internal uh, reconciliations in the lines. Line departments weren't uh, tracking that. There's a, there is not a connection between this software and the town's financial software, Munis. And so uh, the activities that are happening in the line departments, uh, I would say or, uh, some of them are happening in remote sites, some of them happening in odd hours, and there hasn't been uh, enough reconciliation, and that's one of the recommendations in our report as well, that the, the line departments reconcile their permits with uh, the uh, dollars that are being entered into Munis. Okay. okay. Yes. So in, 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 in the department in, in question, um, what changes have been made to, to, to fix what happened? Well, f first of all, the segregation of duties. Uh, uh, the uh, primary clerk, and now there's um, a, 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 another clerk in the office as well, so the two primary clerks could only create an accounts receivable. The accounts receivable, uh, once created, uh, allows for a permit to be printed out, and the cash uh, uh, is received, hopefully a credit card is received or a check is received, we've encouraged them to do that. We've uh, required that they use numbered uh, receipts uh, and we require that they reconcile their cash with the munis. As a matter of fact, print out a report for, from the, the GEO report and attach it to the munis report that goes down to our office at the end of every day. Okay. And that wasn't being done before? Um, well, again, the, the, the problem was that the the primary user was deleting the transaction before sending the edited report 
along with Muniz. So there was no, uh, it just became invisible. There was no record. Of There's no record. Because didn't, didn't have a paper record, which is right. back well, to the piece of paper. The record was eliminated. Yeah, right, right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Cirillo. Um, I think we are all um, grateful that there was immediate follow-up intervention and um, correction to the procedures in order to avoid having this happen. I'll, if Again. I could say one last thing, and I, that I would like to thank the department heads for their response. Uh, they were all willing to meet. They were very interested, obviously, in this issue. They all want their departments to perform at their best. Uh, and, and many of them gave input, uh, suggestions, and I'm deeply grateful to all the departments for their help on this. And, and I, I just will uh, observe that for me, this is an example of a, a, a situation in which we have so much uh, opportunity to use data in a way that is helpful to us that there are just these little tiny cracks that appear every now and then. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I'm, I understand that it is complicated, and my initial question about the audit was all these various systems that we have in place, some of which I gather do not speak as well to one another as they might. Um, it seems to me that our big challenge is to um, continue to be able to yeah. monitor. The technical term for that is interface, and, uh, and there are there are systems that interface with right. our financial system, but there are a great many that cannot. Right. So. I, I, would, yeah, I would just also add that um, in addition to uh, the response of the various department heads to this, uh, we also owe a, a real debt of gratitude to the police. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, first of all, within the transportation department, identifying that there might be a problem, and then the police response that documented and essentially um, uh, gathered the evidence that uh, absolutely um, led to the confession. Huh. Um, it uh, right. Uh, it it was uh, really a, a very professional yeah. response. And, and the town will recover all funds. Um, right. There is an attachment to uh, the uh, the past employees' uh, retirement contributions, and all of those funds will be recovered. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank Thanks. you, Selectman Daly, for thank your. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, I know it was fun. Uh, <laughs> I, I just wanted to add my thanks to our staff and to Powers and Sullivan for the good work on this audit, and and say that our my committee did unanimously vote to accept these reports, and we recommend that this board do take do a vote so to do well. so as well. Yes. Absolutely. Therefore, I this was just as exciting. Come <laughs> to an end, Selectman <laughs> Goldstein. <laughs> So, uh, it's like we should Daly. do this in formal attire from now on, like the Golden Globes or something, and really make a put on a show. Um, would you like to make a motion? <laughs> yes, I would like to move favorable action on the board accepting the um, audit reports for the fiscal year 2013. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyszynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Okay, we'll see you guys next year. Okay, and uh, next item will be a brief presentation by the town administrator to give us a little heads up on the FY15 budget. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, <clears throat> I should, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, make a few comments about the, uh, the audit report and the, uh, the work of the audit committee um, staff and the audit committee. Um, you know, Powers and Sullivan is a very fine auditing firm, and I can assure you that they are very independent and very objective. We're always very nervous when they're here, but to hear uh, some of the things uh, that I heard tonight, uh, you normally don't hear. I think uh, Selak Mushinsky is right in an audit report, and it's really music to our ears. We spend my office, uh, Sean Cronin and Melissa Goff in particular, spend a lot of time thinking about and uh, uh, strengthening our financial controls and reserves and financial position and I think you've uh, heard some of the fruit of that effort so I'm, I'm very pleased and uh, just want to, to mention that. <clears throat> uh, I do want to make a fairly brief presentation this evening on what I'm referring to as a, as a bridge budget concept fiscal year 2015 and so I thought uh, you did receive a memo memorandum from me but I thought I would just 
uh, reduce it into a few uh, cogent slides so I could uh, get through it um, and then uh, answer any questions you might have. So um, uh, a little bit of the background. Uh, obviously, we're, we uh, are in a environment which limits our, our revenue. We have a law in Massachusetts called Proposition 2.5, which limits our tax levy uh, increase from year to year to 2.5%. Uh, that and other issues in, in the operation of municipal and schools in this state uh, contri cr contribute to a, what we refer to as a structural gap, and that is, uh, in general, the average uh, growth in our revenue that's constrained by Proposition, proposition 2.5 um, is exceeded by our uh, rate of expenditures. And there's a number of factors uh, that you've heard about, but uh, this structural gap uh, is one that exists, and especially for <clears throat> a generally a, a re residential type of community like Brookline. So in my opinion and my experience over many years in this business, uh, I, I got in actually in 1981 when Proposition 2 and a half was first enacted. So I've been in, in the municipal government for that whole period and overrides of Proposition 2 and a half are actually an expected phenomenon in municipal budgeting. Every now and then that structural gap will rise to a certain level where a municipality will have to look at their uh, their uh, tax levy and uh, seek an override of Proposition Two and a Half. Now, I feel that our job, as as the uh, the management, is to extend that period of time between those overrides as long as possible, and then when you do have an override, try to reduce the impact on the taxpayers as much as possible. Whether that that's through non-tax revenue sources to maximize those, or to reduce the rate of expenditures, or to introduce efficiencies in the operation which limit the expenditure growth. And I think the town has done a very good job in that. Uh, Brookline's last override was in fiscal year 2009. And we have survived uh, during some very difficult uh, economic periods. Um, the auditors mentioned about uh, state aid and other factors that really uh, impacted us. But we have been able to avoid not only an override, but also wholesale uh, and significant reductions in programs and services that other communities have unfortunately been able to, uh, have not been able to uh, and Mel, avoid. Uh, excuse me, uh, our, our prior, our override prior to that was 94 or 95? Yeah. So. We, we do not do them every other year. Right, we do them very infrequently. And so I, I mentioned in the final bullet on this slide, you know, some of the things that we've done. Uh, clearly, um, controlling our health insurance budget buster by joining the GIC and and uh, you know, taking advantage of, of those opportunities was huge. And also in the last few years, we, we have as the structural gap, especially as it relates to the school department's operations, uh, we've been able to tweak uh, some of the, the revenues and the uh, formula that we've created in order to get by another year and another year. But it's in fiscal 2015 that we're, we are hitting a wall. And of course, that was one of the reasons why the board and the school committee uh, appointed the override study committee in the first place because it, we had projected this uh, this very difficult period of time and um, and and here we are. So you heard a few weeks ago um, Sean Cronin's presentation on the uh, projection of the fiscal 2015 budget, and you you uh, heard about a projected 1.25 million dollar gap um, between uh, what we can allocate uh, to the school department and what their needs are, at least the basic needs. In addition, and as part of the override study committee, uh, the school committee has been effective in talking about some other needs that they have and haven't been able to, um, to handle, and those are uh, primarily non-teaching support staff that is related to enrollment. We have done a relatively good job in keeping up the teaching personnel and keeping the class size and other programs relatively um, uh, un, unfazed by the enrollment, but the, where we have not been able to allocate any resources are in the staff as a support staff. We're talking about guidance personnel, nursing, psychiatric staff, teaching specialists, and administration, um, such as vice principals, and so on. So as we have um, increased enrollment, that's an area that we have not been able to, to keep up with. And also, uh, you've heard a bit about a very comprehensive proposal by the school department to implement a technology plan that would get uh, Brookline back up uh, in the area where, where we should be. 
So in addition to the $1.25 million structural gap that we have, we also have these other needs. Now, um, talked about the override study committee. Uh, this override study committee uh, was appointed jointly by this board and the school committee. And uh, the charge, which, I'll, which I will read out loud, is to determine whether substantially more revenue capacity than what is currently anticipated will be necessary to maintain desired levels of service and fund future liabilities of the town and the public schools, and therefore, whether a voter approved override or overrides at Proposition 2 and a half will be necessary to raise that revenue. And as you well know, uh, under uh, Selectman Banka and School Committee uh, Wolf Ditkoff's uh, leadership, the Override Study Committee has been very hard at work for several months. Uh, they are doing a very comprehensive and objective analysis, and it is done through a subcommittee process, which, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's coming from the ground up, and that takes time. Uh, now, there was um, initially a March 1st deadline for the initial phase of the Override Study Committee's work, and it's, it's my strong observation that the analysis, uh, and more importantly, what's involved in an override is, needs to be community consensus, isn't there yet. And that's not through any fault of anyone, but it's just not there yet. And, I, and I, so that was, has led me to propose this concept of a bridge year budget for fiscal 2015, because I do not believe that by uh, March 1st, um, we will have the necessary uh, analysis and consensus that um, can can be necessary to uh, seek a voter uh, uh, referendum on a, on a debt exclu or tax uh, exclusion, a, on tax override, I should say. Um, so what is the bridge budget? So I've mentioned that in the, in the last few years, we have tweaked the budget, uh, especially at the, end of, at the end of the process, and provided uh, an adjustment to the school department's budget that would allow them to, over, to, 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 to resolve that structural gap and minimize the kind of uh, reductions in programs and services and to keep up with enrollment. What the, what the, in fiscal 2015, that tweaking it will, will not be available. It's just not going to be sufficient enough. And so what I've, I've identified is called a bridge budget, which creates an interim solution that will eventually become part of a, a more permanent solution next year as proposed by the override study committee. It does three major things. It avoids major reductions in educational programs and services. It stems the erosion of the support staffing and services and hopefully will provide a beginning uh, to the technology initiative, uh, which is also that, that, um, that final bullet there. I, I've identified what I consider some principles of a bridge budget and what it is and what it's not. A prince, the bridge budget in fiscal 2015 will be, will be sustainable. In other words, it will become part of the base budget for the future. So we're not taking revenues or expenditures that are somehow be just being pushed off. Uh, we are trying to make it as sustainable and part of the base budget going forward as possible. Um, it would retain the town school partnership formally in the long term. Clearly in a bridge budget, we're talking about modifying uh, the bridge budget or the town school partnership formula in this in this particular year, but uh, I don't see the need to uh, substantially modify that in the long term, and it has served the town very well. <clears throat> uh, it limits major policy decisions that I think are better considered as part of an override process. I, I believe that when you go to the voters, uh, you want to have a very comprehensive uh, plan, uh, and um, uh, hopefully that will consider some significant policy, policy decisions. And uh, I don't feel personally comfortable as the town administrator in making some of those policy decisions without the kind of uh, deliberation and debate that uh, is, uh, is, is, well, is needed and is, is well uh, regarded in Brookline. Um, it hopefully will build upon preliminary recommendations of the override study committee. Now, uh, I mentioned the override study committee uh, is still in the, what I consider be the data gathering phase and the due diligence phase, but very shortly they're going to be coming out of that, and I do believe that shortly they will have some preliminary recommendations, and I do feel that those recommendations are critical to be part of this uh, bridge budget. In particular, uh, we hopefully will rely on some non-tax revenue enhancement and some expenditure and efficiency areas that uh, we very much hope will be um, part of the override study committee's uh, preliminary report. And one of the benefits, I, I believe, is that um, we all know that there is a very significant capital um, override coming down the road on the Devotion School, very likely. And if we can 
create a bridge budget and push off the operating over, override for a year, we'll be able to coordinate those two questions, which I think are, would be very helpful to the voters and uh, give a better sense that we have a full and comprehensive plan. So what is the components of the bridge budget? Uh, I'm reluctant to get into too much detail uh, because uh, we have uh, about another month left to put together our budget and we still haven't uh, even received the governor's uh, proposed budget for the fiscal 15 state budget, which really kicks off our, our process. But um, there are some elements that I, I believe will be included in a bridge budget. First of all, I mentioned the non-tax general revenue support um, that uh, we would allocate probably in a one-time formula change to support the schools. Um, we, you know, quite honestly, I think we have all heard that the area that um, we are looking at and the override study committee is looking hard at is the parking revenue, the uh, parking meter as well as parking violation revenue, which is a very significant component of our, of our revenue piece. So that is an area that we're looking at. Uh, we would like to review conservative budget projections. I think one of the things we talked about or heard about in the um, <coughs> audit committee's report is that the town does a good job in conservatively budgeting and that has served us very well. But this year, I think in fiscal 15, we're gonna have to take a little harder look and we're looking forward in the next couple of weeks getting some information that hopefully will allow us to, to do those uh, less conservative budget projections. I'm thinking primarily chapter 78, our health insurance through the GIC and our collective bargaining reserves. Um, we do believe that the school department will uh, be um, looked at and, and I know have already talked about potential fees for services that they would generate, um, either existing uh, fees that they would be increased or new fees uh, for a, a number of services that they provide or uh, space that they provide in their buildings. Um, and also um, use of some school department reserves or outside budget sources. The school department does receive some grants directly and they have uh, built up some reserves in some of the revolving funds and um, we believe that we can prudently use some of those in fiscal 15. And then finally, implementation of budget efficiencies. Now, um, we, are, we, we think we, we can identify some of those on our own, but as I said before, we're looking at the override study committee who really dug into some of this for some direction in that area. Um, so, as for, to summary, we, we are, uh, I'm making this pr presentation this evening. Uh, the superintendent and I are both going to the override study committee tomorrow evening, and the superintendent has already made a presentation to, to the school committee's finance subcommittee. We're making a presentation to his full subcommittee. Uh, you have a memorandum or a copy of a memorandum that the school superintendent put together for his uh, budget um, subcommittee of the school committee yesterday, I believe it was, or Monday. And, um, but uh, clearly the superintendent has identified what he considers to be um, sufficient revenue or sufficient um, uh, revenue to support the kind of things he needs to do in those three areas. The structural gap, the, the non-support for the uh, support, non-teaching um, uh, personnel and the technology initiative. We have not made any final decisions yet and we still have a month to go. So I'm not making any uh, direct commitments, but I can assure you that the su superintendent and I and his staff and my staff are working very closely together. So um, we will um, seek, beginning tomorrow night, some direction modification of the schedule to the override study committee, which ultimately will be your, your responsibility with the uh, uh, cooperation with the school committee. Uh, we'll review with town school partnership once that happens, and then uh, we'll, be, we'll be presenting our 2015 budget on February 15th. Okay. <clears throat> um, uh, obviously, we can ask questions of Mr. Kleckner uh, if anybody wishes to follow up. But Simon Benka, do you want to um, make any comment at all about the at least the suggestion of the override study committee schedule? Well, the um, yeah, the override study committee. Um, is meeting tomorrow at uh, seven o'clock. Uh, the subcommittees will be reporting. Um, there will be, uh, I think, a number of bullets from each subcommittee. This is uh, essentially uh, an interim report. Uh, there will be a public hearing on the 22nd, the day after that. Um, the um, uh, That's a week, a week after. after. I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Thursday, a week after. Right. A week. Uh, uh, eight days after that. Um, 
And uh, Next on Thursday. 20, yeah, <laughs> yeah, let me back ahead. up. Override <laughs> study committee meeting. Wednesday. Tomorrow, Wednesday, the Wednesday, 22nd of we, January. We will be reporting <laughs> to this board on Tuesday next, the Tuesday 21st. the 21st, right. and then a public hearing the day after that, the uh, 22nd. Um, so um, uh, come one, come all. Uh, join us tomorrow. Uh, um, I think, um, I mean, I, I do want to make one thing uh, clear. Uh, these um, are not going to be recommendations at this point of the override study committee, but I think they uh, the reports of the subcommittees will uh, provide uh, a good idea of the direction uh, and the thinking of uh, the subcommittees at this point as to uh, possible um, steps that can be taken, both in terms of uh, uh, revenues, efficiencies, policy changes, adherence to policy, and so forth. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not going to ask for uh, uh, particular responses right now, but I will say that I appreciate the fact that the town administrator and the school superintendent have been talking to each other about how we can manage um, the possibility of a bridge year, uh, if that seems to be the right thing. It seems to me it's very important to have plans A, B, and if necessary, C uh, available um, over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. So I think uh, we, we certainly are happy to hear that you've been having those conversations and thinking about it, where we will go next. Okay, that said, unless there are specific questions or comments, we will move on. So, uh, we have some appointments to boards and commissions. Uh, get everybody refocused back to the nuts and bolts. The first is Commission for the Disabled, where we do have vacancies. Yes, Madam Chair, we have several vacancies on the Commission for the Disabled. We have a uh, a candidate, Sarah Lynn Allaire, who is, uh, would be proposed for a term expiring in 2016. All those in favor? Aye. 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 On the Conservation Commission, as you recall, that was, uh, <clears throat> we had some, um, what needed some clarification at our last meeting, and I did um, see clarification. The question was whether one of the associate members would be interested in being essentially promoted to a, to a, um, uh, regular membership and that that's not the case in in this case so uh, I'll make a recommendation for a new candidate but let me uh, say that the um, there is uh, one um, income uh, excuse me two incumbents or one incumbent for the regular membership uh, who is uh, Gail McLennan Fenton so I'm interested in to listen here to hear the vote on reappointment of Gail McLennan Fenton for a term expiring in 2016 Aye. Aye. okay and then um, staying with that, there is a vacancy that was uh, made <clears throat> from uh, Mr. Micklejohn not seeking reappointment. And so there is a, um, a, a new candidate, Deborah Myers Michener. Aye. 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 Okay. And, and then she would be for 2016 also, 2016, right? correct. Right. And there is an incumbent uh, on the associate m member uh, category who is uh, interested in reappointment, Pamela Harvey. Aye. Aye. Okay. So the last uh, appointments uh, for this evening um, will be to the Human Relations Youth Resources Commission. Um, and I think it's important for us to put this um, set of appointments into context. It's a transitional year. The bylaw establishing the commission is being reviewed by the Selectman's Diversity Committee with the goal of submitting a revised bylaw to town meeting. There may be a reorganization proposed with a different membership 
that could be voted at the annual town meeting in May 2014. Therefore, under the appointing authority of the Board of Selectmen and current bylaw section 3.14.1, I am recommending that these will be indefinite interim appointments, all terms then ending effective with the implementation of the revised bylaw. There are six vacancies, one incumbent, and two suggested designated slots for a police officer and a student representative. Neither of those slots are mentioned in the current bylaw. Personally, I have serious misgivings about appointing a police officer as a voting member, in part because members must be Brookline residents. And so I'm recommending that we appoint Lieutenant Phil Harrington, who is recommended by Chief O'Leary, to be a liaison to the commission in the same way as the school committee liaison uh, Ben Chang serves, and there is a liaison from the country club, uh, Sandy Batchelder. I do not recommend appointing a student during this transition period. And I do hope eventually the diversity committee will resolve these things um, with their um, recommendations for a, res a revised bylaw. I'm also recommending that, again, under our appointing authority, the selectmen appoint an interim chairman, Enid Shapiro, who is the senior member who is uh, serving a current term that would expire in 2015 and um, would fill that slot until um, the recommendations from the um, diversity committee can be implemented. Any questions about these recommendations? Uh, I do wanna just verify what you said. How many, how many appointments? We can make nine making? appointments. Um, I'll just read them off uh, to you. We have um, well, one, two, three, four vacancies, five vacancies from 2013, two vacancies in 2014, and then two that were these proposed designated police and student representatives but then our 2000 plus, would have been 2015 expiring. plus expiring and Mariella Ames yes and there's and one Rita expiring so, so I, count, I count seven well, Rita's a, um, one two three is Rita four. counted in the she's part of the vacancies one she two is, three four five me. six seven eight nine yes um, I, there was a memo in your packet that's got them numbered I had to do it because I couldn't keep it straight in my own head so if you take a look at that. It so I see nine minus police and minus student is seven. That's if, yes, but we're gonna appoint people to those two slots because they are membership vacancies. In other words, we don't have to designate a police person or a student, we just make membership appointments. To, to Do you be, understand what I'm saying? To be precise, there yeah. are- uh, Vacant th slots. There's uh, the police spot, which, um, you're suggesting be a liaison rather than right. I'm member. suggesting it's not in the bylaw. I don't know where it came up or right. how it came up, but my personal feeling is that it's a real conflict for an officer to be a voting member. Okay. okay. There's a student rep, and then there are seven other spots, five yes. of which are vacant, one of which is Rita McNally, who's not seeking reappointment, and one of which is Mariella Ames, who is seeking reappointment. So it right. would be seven, but you would appoint seven, not, other not counting police. But then you would. Would you appoint but other those, people to the police? Well, I'm saying we can yeah. fill. There, is, there are nine slots. Think of them as slots. There okay. are nine slots that we can make appointments to fill, a total of nine appointments, rather than leaving those two that were so-called police and student open. And but there are, are essentially seven there's citizen seven spots. citizen spots, and then these two others, which we could we, at a, <clears throat> we have the authority to fill them. Um, so we can appoint. Okay. So I would suggest we, we clarify whether we are filling those two extra spots uh, um, before we vote. I think, so of course, clarify. among ourselves. I'm just giving you my recommendations, trying to be helpful. And if you've got the memo and you turn the page over, you'll see I actually uh, drafted some motions, which, again, for your consideration, this is um, to try to help us. But I thought we ought to make it possible for there to be a group that can function and if there are five slot, uh, nine slots, we should appoint nine, nine people. Well, except we really can't appoint nine people 
today because we don't have a student. Well, I'm applied. proposing that this is not a good time to appoint a student. See, right. I'm, I'm just simply saying, let's appoint people. We could hold it vacant. That's our option. You either appoint, make eight appointments and hold the student slot vacant, or you make nine appointments to fill up the commission membership. Neither the police officer nor the student are written into the bylaw in, in any language, so they're strictly optional. Uh, Betsy, if, if we, just um, to clarify, if we put the police position or liaison, whatever you want to call it, aside, and we put the student aside, mm -hmm. there are seven spots that we can fill tonight. Um, if you want to have 15 members, <laughs> but the, the, the bylaw says 15. 15. The, right. ah, the police so, and the so student we, slot have been kind of by tradition. Yeah, it's just traditional. It's I not see. mentioned. I see. So what, okay. So, so I'm, one, I'm two, just three, simply four, saying five, in order six, to have a seven, eight, nine, full commission. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, so now, we would. Now can do the math. <laughs> okay, so we would, we would essentially fill two additional spots with citizens. Right. Um, well, and uh, what about the student spot? Is that, Betsy, considered um, a, it, member, it, a member of the commission? It was. Or it, it, has, it has informally been a, a member of the commission. Now, I don't know whether that person has in reality ever participated and voted. I just don't know that. A few years ago, we did have a student on there that, uh, that participated, and yep. Marsha Heist's son, David, was on mm -hmm. when he was a student. Yep. And he um, participated, and I believe voted. Sure. But uh, um, I think it's with, I've been in a okay. Meeting with well, the what I'm system. trying to say is this is a transition period. It may be for six months or three months, and therefore, rather than recruit somebody into a temporary appointment, a student for whom um, it would be, I don't know. A, uh, uh, confusing, perhaps. I, I just was trying to simplify <coughs> things. I have no opinion about whether we hold it open or whether we fill it with a, a, a citizen appointment. What I'm uh, okay. Well, I'm I'm just trying to get a handle on whether you want to hold that or you're moving that that be. Held I, I was trying as an to open. lay out the options without arguing a position okay. one way or the other for that and I, I don't ha I, I have a strong feeling about the police officer I have no opinion about the student other than I think we should not either we should hold it vacant and only make 14 appointments Seven. or I mean only appoint eight right. people or I do not think it's appropriate to bring a student on at this time I, when it's in transition that's really what more. I'm trying to say I could not so, agree with you more so those are those are the, the kind of all but of the variables. If, if the thinking is that that student position would be a li liaison position, then we could appoint nine tonight. That's correct. And we, um, you know, the, the members, would, the, the newly appointed sort of, commissioners could find a student who could serve as a liaison. But in that would sort of prejudge that issue of whether that would be, if we appointed nine as opposed to eight, that right. would essentially, I, absent a change in the bylaw. Well, since it's not recorded anywhere that there is a student position. I think this is strictly uh, for the board to decide. We, can eight, we could make eight appointments and leave that slot open or not. I would make nine appointments. In fact, I'd move that we make nine interim appointments mm -hmm. um, per the, the, uh, the, the chairman's uh, suggestion earlier. For a one-year term, so you want to want to make should we take that motion first and uh, yeah, we can do that. Um, Ms. Ames, you want to yes. make a comment? Um, I, I do. Mariella Ames, uh, still member of the Human Relations Commission, hopefully reappointed. Um, but I wanted to ask you. I don't know what is the history of. Uh, the Board of Selectmen appointing chairs to different boards and commissions. Uh, but I would like you to note my objection to your making the uh, appointment of the Human Relations Commission chair. Okay, so noted. Thank you. Um, I actually think that does not exclude the possibility of ultimately having the commission take a vote on somebody, but there needs to be transition, and I'm looking for stable transition. That's my goal here. 
Uh, all right, so Selectman Goldstein, you, you are proposing that we agree to fill nine vacancies. Nine vacancies on okay. a one-year interim basis. All right, I don't no, think we I have to vote on that. Is, is that comfortable? Well, you want to, wait chill. a minute. He's Whoops. saying a one-year interim oh, basis? The, the, and the, the, my, I'm, I'm actually saying indefinite because we don't know for how long. That's something that's actually in the bylaw. I read the bylaw carefully, and it allows us to make an indefinite appointment. So if you look... My motion would, would be to fill the vacancies for indefinite terms to be effective until such time as the revised bylaw has been approved by town Good. meeting. My, 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 I, I get that. Okay. Interim, I wanted to, more important to me was that we were not appointing these individuals for specific No, they have no, de they have no okay. dates. The, okay. My goal here was to avoid attaching a date That's it. because it's to be until such time as there's a revi revised bylaw, at which point it might be a nine-member commission for all I know. So. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, this is one bylaw, and it may be the only bylaw in the town dealing with a commission that explicitly allows the selectmen to remove members. Right. So um, it's, um, uh, you know, in, in a sense, any appointment is theoretically indefinite, but uh, I think making it clear given the transition time does make sense. Right, and I, I do want to make it very clear that we anticipate there will be a bylaw in place that will be very, um, um, that will make it clear how many members there are um, and will presumably give another roster with um, uh, staggered terms. You know, I mean, we'll just probably have to start all over again. Right. Anyway, I know it's complicated. Are, are we more or less understanding where we're going here now, folks? Well, there's there's a motion, right? Yeah, we by Selectman Goldstein to appoint nine members. Well, I think if you take the top one in on the back page, turn on the the, the reverse of the page, that's actually. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And then we'll we'll go down the roster and vote the the names. Okay. I had tried to anticipate you could substitute a number there, but I was trying to help everybody get on the same page. Okay. Sorry, are, are we motion? okay? Okay. Are you, that, no, the, uh, the motion is. That's your good. motion, yeah, Selectman Gold, that that Selectman Goldstein. Motion. Okay. All right. Uh, all in favor of the motion to appoint nine members to fill expiring terms or vacancies on the Human Relations Youth Resources Commission, each for an indefinite term to be effective until such time as a revised bylaw has been approved by town meeting. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Baker? Aye. Selectman Goldstein? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. Chair votes aye. And now I will turn um, the microphone over to the town administrator and we will choose nine we will appoint nine people, persons. Or, or try to. Or try yeah, to. Yeah, so my, right. my uh, proposal is that um, I will read off each candidate in alphabetical order, and after reading the name of the individual, um, uh, normally we just uh, speak up, but I think in this case, I think because there's so many, I'd like to, if the board would just raise their hand instead of, uh, and then I will count as we go along. And uh, there may be some ties, and if that's the case, we'll have to do another round of voting, but. Uh, I, I propose that we uh, we take the top nine uh, vote getters um, uh, for the, for this uh, for this process. So, are, are you suggesting um, it would be we'd go through the we go through the names and the top nine who get the most votes? Correct. So we're going to go through the whole list. That's correct. Gotcha. But okay. I, but it, it, the, the normal histor historical way is to do it alphabetically. So Correct. Just yeah. so gotcha. it's so arbitrary, in words, but If somebody traditional. gets a vote of three versus two, that doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're appointed at that point. If there are nine others who get four, get four or three. Yeah, yeah we have right. To we'll have to process, track but. how many votes people get, but let's just say an individual who gets three votes will be considered, and if there are ten people who get three votes and nine people or people who get four. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to resolve this. But Let's just see what happens. Let's hope it's not that complicated, all okay. right? I, I tried to lay out a system I thought would at least be possible. Yeah, so I will read the names in alphabetical order. After I read each name, the board should uh, indicate their support by raising their hand. Mariella Ames. Thank you. 
Arthur Conquest. Alex Coleman. Daniel Fitzgibbons. Ernest Fry. Brian Miles. Anthony Narrow. Usmano Nzanku. Kelly Race. Cruz Sanabria. Arthur Schneider. Valencia Sparrow. Dwayne Tyndall. Cornelia, Cornelia Vanderzeel. Okay. So, so let me see. So um, <laughs> total about. I have um, Mr. Coleman with five. Uh, Mr. Miles with five. Ms. Race with five. Mr. Sanabria with five. Valencia Sparrow with five. Dwayne Tyndall with five. So that is one, one, two, three, four, five. That's six members. So then I have um, Mr. Fry with four. So that's number, that's seven. Mr. Nara with four. That's eight. And I have um, two members with with three, as I as I understand. So I think. And who are they? Mariella Ames and Connie Vanderzeel. So I would propose um, that we. <clears throat> take another vote on those two individuals to break that tie. Is that acceptable to the board? Yeah. You ready? So we vote for one of these two people. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. I, I think okay. that's the only way to yes. break that tie. Yes, okay, way to do it. Okay, got it. You flip a coin. <laughs> yeah, that is the other possibility, or you could uh, stop with eight. <laughs> but I think we, we've agreed to vote nine, so we have to break the tie, right? Okay. So I will read the names again. Mariella Ames. And um, um, Connie Vanderzeel. Okay, so um, Mary Ames is the ninth member appointed. Good. So I can read those off again if that might help. Um, Mary Ames, Alex Coleman, Ernest Fry, Brian Miles, Anthony Naro, Kelly Race, Cruz Sanabria, Valencia Sparrow, Dwayne Tyndall. Okay. okay. And final vote. One more is a motion to appoint Enid Shapiro as a, an interim chairman for an indefinite, indefinite term. Um, I'm willing to stop there if members would like to make it possible uh, easily for the commission to create its own chairperson in the future. I was really trying to create some stability by suggesting that the interim chairman uh, continue until the new bylaw was uh, in place, but I could be argued around that. People having well, I views. I would say interim chair, and if if the commission decides that they're going to appoint somebody else, let you know they may. But I think this gives them a, a starting off point. Right. Since it's essentially a brand new commission, somebody should be should be you know to, able to take the reins from the beginning. And I think. Agree with that. Yeah. All right, then uh, the motion would be to appoint Enid Shapiro interim, interim chair, interim chair person for an indefinite term. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Binka. Aye. Selectman Goldstein. Aye. Selectman Wyszynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. And I believe that concludes the business of the Board of Selectmen for January 14th.